everybody knows everybody. So um, I'll introduce myself. I'm Denise Wheeler, Select Board. Um, Cliff, you want to go next? Sure, Cliff Emmons, Calis Select Board. Rose? John Rose Kalchuk, Calis Select Board. Go ahead, John. John Brabant, Vice Chair, Calis Select Board. And Sharon? Sharon Wynn, Calis Select Board. And then we have Katie, who's our recording secretary and keeps her computer on mute and does our minutes. So, um, oh, is Sage is Sage connected now, Cliff? No, uh, no. You know what? I think Sage, if you can hear us, would you please unmute and let us know? Sage is on mute, but I believe the audio is connected for Sage. Okay, and then we have. I only know this Naomi because I can see the little box with your name. Yeah. <laughs> Do you want to introduce yourself? Sure, I'm Naomi Reed. I live over on Old West Church. We just bought um, Happy and David's house last year. So okay, it's really hard to hear you. Thank you, Consolidated. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Hi, <laughs> I'm Naomi. I live on Old West Church. We bought um, David and Kathy's house, the, the house next to the Old West Church. Oh, Ka David and Catherine year. Morse. Yeah. Yeah, <clears throat> welcome. Thank you. We used to live up on Robinson Hill. So we moved away for a while and then came back and bought this place. And Michael? Michael Fullerton up in North Callis. I'm here because my wife and I have a permit application in tonight for a little right away work. And I don't know who that is by phone. Alfred. Oh, hey, Alfred. How are you? Hi there. Good. I, I bet you guys are glad the weather's a little cooler. Yeah, it's changed a little bit. Yeah, I'm gonna go back up. A little up. bit of rain. Yep. yep. <laughs> so Alfred is our road commissioner for that. We were just doing some introductions, Alfred. So. Okay. Um, Denise. Yes. Yes. I'm sorry. This is Sage Kennedy. I have finally gotten. Oh, there you are. Mic'd up and whatever in Central Callis. So here I am. Central Callis. Okay, I like that. Yeah, absolutely. You look at that triangle or that diamond, and there I am. There you are. You're at the. You're at your. You're I'm at Jack Hill Road and Peak and Brook. Yeah. Okay. So, is there any public comment for items not on the agenda? Additions or changes to the agenda? All right. Let's get started. Um, I put on the agenda about the solar powered lights. Toby sent an email that he's not able to join us tonight, but he did do some preliminary work and gave us a cost um, and sent us a, a website that all the documents are in the folder. And he said they're not expensive and they can be mounted to any pole. Um, but just by way of some background, we have been looking and talking about these solar powered lights in East Callis for a couple of years. And we were almost there with Dan Courier's help from CVRPC and then he left and went to the Agency of Transportation. So it kind of got dropped by the wayside, but um, Toby believes that we might be able to afford to do this in East Callis out of the current highway budget. I'm not sure which line item that might be. Alfred, do you know? Uh, we certainly don't have a line item for that. Um, we'd probably have to make a new one maybe, or yeah. maybe take it out of the miscellaneous. Okay, so in my uh, question, yeah, okay. My question to Toby was going to be, and I think I asked him that, but he didn't really answer it. Um, East Callis, that's Route 14, so it has to have a state permit. And yep. I was, and I, I checked, I contacted every place I could possibly think of to see if there was any grants available and there's not. Um, Woodbury just took it out of their town highway budget and, and got them installed. They have the permanent flashing lights. I think if you've been to, and, and if you've been to Hardwick or Woodbury, you'll see those signs, the flashing lights. 
Uh, right, flashes at your speed. Right, right. So um, I just wanted to see what where the select board what you wanted to do. Um, let's have a discussion about it. I don't know. I can hear some background noise from somebody's. Rose. Um, so there, I see on the background noise. I've muted your mic for a minute. Go ahead. There, there is a um, a line item in the highway budget for road signs, and I think we budgeted four thousand this year. Oh, so maybe it would come out of there. That might be what Toby's thinking. Good point. Um, I was hoping that in East Callis we would get the permanently mounted ones, not the cart kind that you move around. Mm -hmm. Um. We also, um, I mentioned that maybe we could get one um, on Lightning Ridge I, by the school. Maybe the school board could come up with the money for one by the school. And then maybe one as you're coming into Maple Corner from County Road. But that, you know, that's a lot. And the ones that we've been mainly talking about are in East Callis. So what's, what are the board's thoughts? Cliff, you wanna go? Yeah, um, we have had several of the residents and uh, town folk uh, raise concerns about speeding in various areas. If our budget is, has the room to support purchasing multiple signs so that we can have them more or less permanent in three different areas within the town, I, I think we should do it. Okay, John? My, my cursor wandered on me. Sorry about uh -oh. that. Um, I, I agree with Cliff. I'd like to have more than one sign, but I would like to also, it's it's only, I think, a couple hundred bucks per pole, the uh, the, uh, the removable bracket, the dismant, disconnecting bracket, whatever you call it, to allow us to move the signs elsewhere because um, Three signs would be great, but it, we might have occasion to want to move them to an, another couple locations. Just if we're having great success and people are starting to figure out that, for instance, the speed in Maple Corner is what it should be, 25, but we have problems elsewhere and the sheriff isn't always able to be there, we might want to be able to move these things around like we did the speed cart, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, so that would be my only suggesting that we that we make sure that they're on the uh non mounted on the non-permanent brackets on those poles i wonder uh, if I, are I those wonder standard if... poles alfred um they they are it's an anchor so you drive the anchor in the ground first it's about three feet long so you drive that into the ground first and then the actual sign post fits inside of it and that's meant so that if a car goes off the road and hits that sign, it will fold over and not come into the windshield. Mm -hmm. So you, that's why you have to have that anchor. All of our signs that we put in now, we're using anchors so that they will do just that. They'll fold over and not into the windshield. But, but this unit would mount on a conventional pole other than, you know, I mean, the anchor system i understand the break system but. right they fit on a regular sign post the square channel sign post that we use for all of our signs and the bracket i think the bracket that you refer to is is the anchor that goes into the ground so it uh -huh. certainly could be moved certainly could be moved to any location you want to put it okay. yeah but it, even on we made mention he, of a bracket that's all but even on 14 we would still we would have to get another we would have to get a permit even though they're temporary, correct? That's right. Yes. Anything goes in the state right away is need to be needs to be permitted. Right. But for our town roads, we can we can just do it. That's right. That's, yeah. If it's in our right of way, we can put a sign anywhere or a or a device like this anywhere in our right of way. Okay. Um, Rose, I know you made a comment about the, the budget part, but do you have anything else? Um, yeah, so Actually, um, last year we budgeted 4,000 for road signs. This year we budgeted 3,000. Um, and this email from Toby um, says that each sign costs about 2675. Yeah. So three, yeah. three signs would cost 8,500. Right. Um, and then he says, suggest using 
one universal mounting bracket. And then that way it could get moved around. So that bracket is 125. John, I just forwarded you that email. So yeah, I mean, I, I think it's good. I, I think um, we'll have more versatility if we are able to move it or move them, move these signs. Um, and, you know, 8,500, um, as long as we could, yeah, I mean, that's for three signs. I don't know if you want to go to two signs to drop it down a little bit. Yeah, it might well, be. I'll just, I'll just point out that um, two signs is going to wipe out our sign budget, which we buy stop signs, speed limit signs, yeah. yep. the posts, all that. So, you know, we may want to think about not burning that whole sign budget up. Maybe we can find the money from a different line item. Yeah. Well, and maybe we just maybe we just start out slow and we buy one. Right. Or like you said, if, if the school is willing to chip in for one, then we got two in town. You know, the highway buys one, they buy one, and then we can sort of juggle them around with, the, you know, if they're able to do that for us. Yeah, especially if we use, especially if we use it mainly by the school, because I know we've heard over the years about people driving their kids to school and they're in a big hurry because they're late. So anyways, um, Sharon, you want to have, you want to chime in? Uh, yeah, thanks. Okay. Um, if there's no savings in buying bulk, then I why not start with one? Um, we're at the very beginning of the fiscal year. We can circle back at the end of the year or look at it again in next year's budget. So I'd like to make the motion that we buy one movable sign. Okay, and I would second that um, motion as well. So there's any further discussion, John? So I'm sorry, Sage. Am I, 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 I allowed to speak at all during this? I'm sorry. Oh yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I always give everybody a turn. Okay. John, but John's on the board, and he absolutely, has, yeah. John. I I'll defer. I'll first. defer to to our guests. Sage, go ahead. So I want to say East Callis should be the first place where you put a speeding sign. It is not been the most looked at area has a lot of kids in it we begged for a crosswalk across route 14 not sure how that has gone i know there was also speeding um surveys that went on east callus i i don't even know if you need a temporary one but one there starting there would really mean a lot to the community also yeah. The schools, I'm pretty sure right now, you shouldn't be asking the school for coughing up any money. They are they are keeping their head above water barely, but that's just my opinion. Yeah. And I'm sorry, and thank you so much for letting, letting me speak. Oh, sure, absolutely. We always let everybody speak. Thanks. John? Um while I concur generally with Sharon's idea, um, and I was going to say this before Sage spoke, uh, I think the priority is getting one through the process on Route 14, that that's one that should be there forever. And I think you need one going both directions. So that's two. Right. So one coming into the town. So that's two there. And whether we buy a third or just use the speed cart and move that around for the time being until next fiscal year, that might be something to consider. But I, I think we need one for each direction in East Cows that, that are permanently affixed. Of course, we still, we first need to apply for the right of way access. Uh, right. And then, and then only then would we then make the Well, it's, it, it's usually recommended that you have two because if you go, if you're by the town garage and you're going down that stretch of road, it's 50, and then all of a sudden it's 35. And a lot of people don't slow down. And that's by a nice ball street. Field. Say what? By the ball field where the kids right. are. Yeah, exactly. And then coming into East Callis, what was recommended was two. Two? Right, That was what. that's what you usually do is you put up two. Oh, one in each direction. I'm right, sure. yeah. But if there's a budget issue, I would be pleased if there was one. 
So are you making a, a, an amendment to Sharon's motion, a friendly amendment? If it's, if it's received as a friendly one, I, I don't know if it is. I, I think you need, I don't know how you pro prioritize north versus south. I don't either. On that road. I, I, I don't know if the, if the motion means to put it on Route 14. The motion was just to purchase a unit. I didn't hear any further explanation. Maybe Sharon can explain further what her thinking is, maybe. <laughs> My thinking was budget driven that we have the budget for one. I hear I hear all the points you guys are making, but um, if we get one movable one now, it could move back and forth and use Callus. And even what are we are on July 13th. We're less than two weeks into the fiscal year. Right. We could revisit the issue. It could move back and forth on each side of, of ah. I'm disagreeing with the need. I just think that we need to be cautious and with that price tag. Well, and I want to ask Alfred how much of a, what is it like to have to move this? Uh, well, it's probably a couple of guys for for under an hour, I would say, because you got to drive an anchor. And I suppose if you had designated spots, you could just leave the anchor in the ground and just move the post itself Yeah. each each time. So once the once the anchors are in, it's it's not much time at all. I mean, probably mm -hmm. one guy myself could do that. Just you know, because the unit is attached to the post, and you just stick it into the inside of the anchor, mm -hmm. and you put a bolt. Except in the but, winter, Alfred. It, what's that? Except in the winter, you move it, and you'll never find the anchor again. <laughs> right. Well, that's true. Yeah, you'd probably have to put a post next to it or something to mark it because when the snow comes, it's going to cover for sure. Right. Um, can I just ask one question? Sure. Um, just for my own two cents. Um, where are we with the sheriff? Are we still, are we, are they still under manpowered? And that's why we don't have sheriffs no, out he's here been, so much? Um, I think they are still under manpowered. We just renewed our contract. They've been in Maple Corner. They've been in East Callis they're supposed to set up in other places in town okay because i mean my opinion is that that's going to be the solution if we can get get more blue lights out here it's going to remind people of of what they're doing and it's speeding right and, and that's and i mean not to say that these these signs aren't effective because i believe they are but um it seems like if we're going to spend money let's spend money where we can get some of it back also from the tickets right and we and we do that but we only have a certain amount budgeted for the sheriff as well right but right now we're talking about taking money from the budget in other places to do something that's not budgeted why can't we take some of the sign money to go towards the sheriff budget or or a, a different line item mm -hmm. i mean I, I think i just think personally that if it's if we're spending money I think it's more effective to have a sheriff out here because that's going to, you know, it's going to be much more effective than the signs. Okay. Thanks for your comments. Um, okay. Now I see Craig has his hand up and Rose does. Uh, yeah. Thank you. I just noticed a, a new sign in Montpelier on Mary Street uh, after, if you're heading like away from the food co-op, there's a new one right there. It's pretty small. It's larger. And you cut out really, when I, you cut I'm out when you, you cut out yeah. when you say again. I'm, I'm, I saw I've seen a new one in Montpelier over the last couple of weeks. It's a smaller unit. It, it's at eye level um, and it's caused me to slow down. That's 25 through there. I have a hard time understanding how some of these signs cost so much money. And I'm wondering if it's worth contacting Montpelier City Works to say, what's this new sign? They're much smaller, and apparently it's going to be permanently mounted there, but maybe it's way cheaper. I, I'm just wondering if it's worth checking into other yeah. models, or are there new models available that might be less money? Thank you. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Rose? Um, so there's $4,000 in the sheriff patrol budget. Yeah. Three thousand dollars in the uh, road sign budget. So if you add, um, according to Toby's email, the cost of one sign and one hundred and seventy-five dollars for shipping and one hundred and twenty-five for that universal mounting bracket, it's twenty-nine seventy-five for one sign. 
Okay. So that would that would totally wipe out Alfred's road sign budget for the year, unless, like he said, we would just take it from you know somewhere else in the budget. So, mm -hmm. um, I I I I think I um, at this point I think I favor Sharon's idea of getting one. Um, I don't know that I'm I'm not a hundred percent sure, but. Um, we are new into this budget and um to blow out a whole line item on one sign is quite a lot mm -hmm. and uh, the blue lights if someone gets a ticket they kind of remember that area so the sheriff might be more effective well it might there might be a way that we can do as alfred said or as craig suggested check with montpelier city public works and that would be something we could ask toby to do um john uh, a couple of things. I, I understand this motion to be purchase of one uh, radar, what they call radar speed limit sign. Um, I think Sharon amended her motion, as I understand it, to, to for us to cite two pole ro locations in East Callis Village to start as part of the motion. Uh, second is a commentary regarding policing and the effectiveness of policing. Um, Montpelier has a full-time police force and on salary, they're getting paid around the clock. It doesn't cost them more or less. And as we all know, anyone who's driven down County Road and descended down Upper Main Street, if you're not at 20, before they had the radar control sign, we all knew not to exceed 25 or 26 because the police were there with bicycle radar in the summer and radar everywhere. We all knew that. Nevertheless, Montpelier thought it was wise to install a permanent sign. My understanding is that Montpelier and the Montpelier's residents have been really happy that that sign has actually done more than the policing has because it's continuous. And a lot of times people speed not intentionally. It's just like their heads are somewhere else that are on the cell phone. So it's kind of a wake up. And, you know, if someone wants to go 100, they're going to go 100. They're going to know at night the sheriff's not there. Um, but it's for people who don't tend to want to be scofflaws. So I, I think this sign, the idea of buying us one sign, we'll test run it and put it up, put in, install two poles. I think that's a good idea. All right. Anybody else? Cliff? Just want to make sure I understand. Sharon, your motion includes the uh, one sign and the universal mounting bracket? Yes. Okay. It, it um, is the, to move the sign back and forth. Go ahead. I, I intended to include what we need for Alfred to efficiently move the sign back and forth on the opposite sides of 14 in East Callis. And maybe Perfect. other. Perfect. Thank you. Anything else, Clark? No, you had something else you wanted to say, Sharon? Go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, the other thing I I would like to propose uh, a friendly amendment, and that is we uh, vote to approve this with a caveat that um, we asked Toby just to double check pricing, see if we can find anything that's uh, more uh, efficiently priced. Maybe perhaps a call, as Craig suggested, to East Montpelier. Yeah, sounds good to me. So I'll, that I'll... would be my that would be my motion or friendly amendment to the motion. Sharon, do you accept that? Yes, I do. It was city of Montpelier. Okay, and I'll second it with the friendly amendment as noted. Are you ready to vote? We do, oh, John? Just why, FYI, I'm surfing the internet, I'm not paying attention to your meeting, select board. Uh, <laughs> no, not really. Uh, to, to, um, with regard to what Cliff has suggested, I immediately found a solar traffic system speed radar speed sign, 2324 free shipping. So there are, are other opportunities out there. Okay. So, so part of the motion is to advise Toby to, um, check with the city of Montpelier. Maybe we want to have him check with, Maybe we don't want to vote on this tonight. I, I'm just trying to think this through. 
maybe we ask Toby to do some more searches, check other websites, check with City of Montpelier, and defer voting on this until next meeting, maybe? That makes sense? I'd be okay with that because then we could also ask Toby what portion of the budget he imagined pulling this from. Right. Okay, so I will withdraw my seconds to the motion and the friendly amendment. Sure, withdrawn. Okay, thanks but, all. But it is, but Denise, I, I guess I just wanna underscore that hearing from the folks in East Callis, how important this is. Um, if Toby can't be here, then let's make sure we get something from him so we can take action next time. Yes, I think I think what happens on the second Monday of the month is it ends up being a meeting at the a fire department meeting, I think, because he's usually available the last meeting of the month. All right, so let's move on. Um, curb cut request, Thorin Markison. I don't know that he's on. I did send him the agenda. The curb cut permit application is in the folder. Um, I did try to find on the county road where it was marked and I couldn't find anything. Um, and I had asked the question, if, you know, is this, why is there an, a new curb cut needed when there's already an existing one? Did anybody else drive by and take a look? No. Yeah, I drove by and took a look. Um, they, they're doing a lot of remodeling on the property. Um, I think they're converting the, what was the garage into more or less a storage shed or something, putting a, um, some kind of porch on the southern side of the prop house. And that's why they want to have the drive there so that the drive's closer to where the main entrance to the house will be. Okay. Um, Alfred, did you, John? Well, so Cliff, just, I, I did the slow break review. Um, I could see where the existing driveway was and I also could see like a two track place where they've been pulling in and out. Is that the new location? As you understand that'd it. be my best guess because like denise said it wasn't clearly outlined for me to make sure that that's where it was okay but based upon what i see in the application and um looking at the site yeah I, I, that's my guess is approximately where it would be rose um <clears throat> i as i said in my email i'll defer um my opinion based on Alfred and Toby's assessment. Um, I did not go and see it. Okay, Sharon? Same. Okay, Alfred? Uh, yeah, I, the only thing that I could see is that, I mean, I'm judging by his uh, diagram that he drawed, he just wants to move, move his driveway a little bit south, essentially on the opposite side of his house from where it is now. And I know in the past we've had them, uh, if they want to change from an existing to a proposed, then they have to block off or discard the, the existing curb cut. Right. Cause we only want there to be one curb cut on that road. Right. Uh, as far as sight distance, it's, it's wide open, clear there. So that's, that's a non-issue. Um, I don't believe there's going to be any sort of water problem there. Um, there's no ditch, so I don't think he would need a culvert. Um, I didn't really notice if, if the existing one has a culvert or not, but I think the way of the, the lay of the land is that the water would be further down his driveway, out of the right of way anyways. Okay. And you actually went and looked at it, right? I actually didn't, but I am familiar with the property and I know I know the site distance is fine. Um, I didn't get this until late in the week last week, so I didn't really get a chance to go look at it. Um, but it's pretty clear in his diagram, and like I said, I'm familiar with the property, so I, I, I would, and I also talked to Toby about it, and he shares the same, the same opinion that I have is, you know, it's not a problem. 
Okay, anybody else? Um, yeah, and like I said, I mean, I'm, I'm glad that Cliff and John and I um, at least attempted to do us to take a site visit since we're signing off on the curb cut permit. Um, I like to know what I'm signing off on. So I appreciate Toby your input. Um, oh, there's everybody. There we go. Um, Cliff. Um, I have some concerns about the uh, sight distance because um, that portion of the road, I believe, is it's, isn't it, Alfie? Isn't it 50 miles an hour? Yes, it is. Yeah. And I believe the zoning administrator said something about the requirement is 425 feet sight distance in either direction. And on the application, it lists um, three, I believe it's 300 feet in one direction and 1,600 feet in the other direction. I can pull the application back up if everyone would like to see it. Yeah, that's what it says. <clears throat> What was well, it? I've never, never heard of 450 feet of sight distance. It's always been Four. 300. 425. Right. Well, 425 is, is still an odd number to me. It's a, I've always gone with 300 feet of sight distance as far as curb cuts go. But that's on the, that's on the dirt roads, I think. Ooh. It's uh, based okay. on B, yeah, B71 and right. the speed limit. And what did you find, Rose? 425? Yeah, 425. Yeah, so that's a, I think that's a, a problem. John? I don't see this as an urgent rush to decide tonight. Uh, because it's a construction site. And, you know, clearly he's using both anyways. I, I mean, blind eye. But um, I went by and I, the only question that came to mind was from the south is a bend uh, below that house to the south of it. And I didn't know if there, uh, if there was enough sight distance, there might very well be, but, um, mm -hmm. just doing a quick drive by it, that was a question that came to mind. So I was thinking if Alfred went out there, it would be better yeah. before render a decision. And I, I, again, he's, he's not selling the place next week and, uh, right. it's, it's in process. I think he's, he can handle two weeks. He's using it anyway, <laughs> but, uh, I just don't want to bless something I'm not sure of. So I would be comfortable, um, maybe two of us going with Alfred to the site, just to just to check it out. Does who has who wants to or who has time? John, uh, I can. Okay. So at his convenience, pretty much, except for tomorrow. Not tomorrow. Okay. <laughs> Well, 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 that was my favorite day, John. Come on. Well, tomorrow well, afternoon. Just... Tomorrow afternoon, I can, but in the morning, I have a, an appointment with with uh, my car. Okay, so why yeah. don't I just why don't I um, get some times from you guys, and I can send. He's got his email here on this application, and I think it, and his phone number, so we can just give him a call and see if we can work out a time. That yeah, I'm available. I'm available whenever you're ready. Okay, and I can join in or somebody else can whoever wants to might make sense to see if uh, bob's available oh bob martin he's the zoning administrator yeah he's the one who brought up the point about the sight lines oh i see okay and so so the rose has rose is confirmed by looking at the documents it's 425 <laughs> right okay yeah i was actually looking at bob's email Okay. Is, is there anything else besides line of sight? I guess also the culverts and all the runoff, if that's a place where there is any such thing? Well, I think it would be good for Alfred to check that out. So, you know. I have, I have no problem with that. I just, I, like I said, I just received this last week and now today yeah. we're talking about it. So I just didn't get a chance to look at this. Uh, and normally these don't move this fast. So, I, that's why I didn't, you know, make it a high priority to go look at it. But I am totally willing to go look at it tomorrow, and uh, and then I can form a better opinion if or whenever you guys decide is a good time to meet there. Okay, well, stay tuned, and we'll come up with a time. Okay. All right, ready to move on to. Well, um, I just I had one further comment. Um, yes. In, 
in looking at um, the email that was forwarded, these these included the zoning applications and not a curb cut application. So it was just a little bit different. Didn't really contain, I think, some of the same questions or information. So that's just being nitpicky, but I just wanted to mention that, that it wasn't an actual curb cut application. Um, yeah, there was one. Cliff, yeah, I got I got one. I'm looking at it. I think Cliff, did you call it? You called it up, didn't you? I have two that I'm looking at and they're zoning applications. Okay, sorry. I take that back. You got it. Okay, very good. Mm -hmm. All right, let's move on to North Callis. Um, this is just a permit to do some temporary work, Michael, right? That's correct. We're having a foundation job and he needs to build a little ramp down to our yard to get his equipment in and out. How long is that going to be there? Two to two and a half weeks. Oh, okay. I hope. Yeah, right. I bet you do. <laughs> I wish it wasn't happening, but what are you going to do? Yeah, hey, it's only money. Um, any of the board members have any questions? And Alfred, do you have any comments? I'll let the board go first. Cliff? I don't have any questions. John? Um, well, I just, you know, we, when we approve these temporary, maybe limited site distance, I don't know if it is or not, um, applications where there's a need for construction is Alfred will have uh, conditions uh, to ensure the safe movement of traffic and pedestrians and bicyclists and all that. So I'll just defer to Alfred on that. Yeah, I was going to, well, I was going to ask if Alfred, if we're putting, are we putting up some town cones there so people uh, no that would be the responsibility of the contractor okay. and uh, me and Toby met with Michael uh, I believe it was last Monday and uh, discussed with him the the what would be needed for the, the the road signs and protection for the traveling public and so I think that Michael's gotten got that information and I'm sure that he will pass that on to his contractor and judging from the contractors from my experience with that contractor I'm sure he is capable of providing that safety stuff that we would need yeah I've talked with Jim Rogers of John Rogers and Son construction and he's well aware of what it needs and he has no problem providing it okay so the contractor will provide the necessary Um, Sign safety, Sign necessary safety devices. Necessary safety devices and signage. Okay, and you said this was for roughly two and a half weeks? Approximately, yeah. I hope and it when, won't be that. When will it start? Uh, a week from yesterday, Monday the 21st. Tuesday, Tuesday the 21st? Uh, well, Monday, whatever that day is. Monday. 20th. 20th. Yeah. 20th. Lord, Lord willing and the crypt don't rise. Right, exactly. <laughs> okay, so work to commence July 20th for approximately two and a half weeks. Yes. Okay, any other board member questions? No. All right, would somebody like to make a motion to approve the temporary right of way? So moved. Second. Okay. Um, we'll have to leave this document at the town office to get signed by everyone. <clears throat> Is everybody okay to come down to the town office and sign this? Yeah, not tomorrow. Yeah. Is there, what's the, when, by when does it have to be signed? Well, normally we would have just sent it around the table and signed it, but we, if we could get it signed by Wednesday, if yeah. the contractor's coming next Monday, so Michael has the permit. Does that work for everyone? 
Yeah, I could do it after work tomorrow night. Okay. I will get yeah, it down there. Me. I can do it in the, Denise, I can do it in the morning. Is it going to be there in the morning tomorrow? Like by nine? I can't, pro I can't promise that depending on when we get done here. It's your, it's in your hands right now. Is that it? Okay. Yeah, I just, I have what, I just printed it off from what was sent to me. Why don't I print it and sign it and drop it off there in the morning? Um, you could do that. Why don't, you know what I can do? Why don't I fact, why don't I scan this and send it to you, Sharon? You can print it off because I just, I just wrote the conditions on here. I could scan it and email it to you. I can do it while we're meeting. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. All those in favor of the motion, Cliff? Aye. John? Aye. Sharon? Aye. Rose? Aye. And I'm an aye. All right. You got it, Michael. All right. Thanks. I'll make one last comment. The 25 mile an hour speed sign on Upper Main Street in Montpelier has a lot less to do with the speed of traffic than the crummy condition of the highway. Anybody going <laughs> over 25 doesn't respect his car. <laughs> there you go. There's that too. All right. Thanks very much. Uh, okay, I'm thank you, go, Michael. I'm going to log off and go to another Zoom uh, open mic session in Jackson, Wyoming. Ooh, that sounds like fun. Safe uh, travels, yeah. Michael. Oh, yeah. Thanks. Take care. Okay. Um, we talked last time. I think this was one of the things that Sharon had asked me to put on about doing a joint meeting with um, operations, road commissioner, conservation commission um, for a comprehensive approach to the town road and conservation practices. What would you like to do with this going forward? I, well, let me start because I because I I didn't bring up the meeting. I brought up the concern from a resident that trees are dying, be possibly related to road maintenance practices, which was con which Alfred was was confirmed uh, from the perspective of folks on the com on the um, conservation commission. So it just made me it just made it, my reason for bringing it to the select board was as an as an FYI that I'd heard the concern, um, saw the evidence of it, if that's where it's coming from. And, it, and I'm not, I'm not sh so, sh I don't know that we as a select board have to convene the conservation committee, commission and the road crew to work together. I think what I would support is a clear statement from the select board that it's our expectation that road maintenance consider the environmental health of our trees and everything except the invasives on the side of the road as a as a priority as much as reasonably possible while maintaining safe safe roads so back when this came up i think several years ago and we constituted a roads committee um, it went through several different groups of people. Um, Stephanie was going to try to be on tonight, but she wasn't feeling well. So maybe um, we need to see what the Conservation Commission wants to do in regards to this. Is that kind of what you're suggesting, Sharon? Yeah, I think hearing, well, having them but what I'm also looking for is that the select board not sit in the middle of this conversation. Instead, that we provide a clear direction that that the two groups are working together and that road maintenance considers broader issues than how do you clear the road. Yeah, and that's sort of what the, the road standards that we adopted, which are now sadly out of date, um, did get into that. And it was the goal then that and Alfred was on um, the roads committee, that they work in harmony to try to come up with some ways to do just what we're talking about. So it may be that we ask the roads committee, which included 
Um, I think Rose used to go to those meetings, it included Alfred and members of the Conservation Commission. And Rick Keen was on there because he's got a lot of experience with AOT road stuff. So maybe the maybe we could ask that the roads committee be re, re revamped or revitalized or whatever the right word is. That, well, that I was, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Rose. I was going to say I was the select board liaison on the roads committee, and um, you know, as I've mentioned before, they have not met in you know four or five or six years since I, either 2014 or 2015 um they haven't met in a long time so there really there really is no roads committee um and then more recently we adopted um when albie al uh, excuse me when toby brought forward the state standards so we no longer have the callus vermont road standards that we used to have we now have the state standards um, right, for road, but, road and bridge standards. But when we did this before and adopted the road and bridge standards, I remember that as long as our standards weren't less than the state, if they were more than the state, the state approved them. Yeah, but they're but once they expire, they expire. Oh, so right, now right. the ones that we have to operate on under are the state ones. Right, but we could do like we did before and sure. have our own if we can get yeah. the, man, the man and the woman power to do it. John? I think what you're saying, Denise, we can, to the extent that we can add or augment what the state minimums are, we can do that. And so I would simply suggest that we maybe even next select board meeting to get this thing going, uh, that we evaluate the existing road standards and maybe pass a motion what this is an ordinance, right? No, it's a standard um, that that we uh, adopt, readopt the standard to the extent that they are not in conflict and and augment the state standard. So then, um, whatever is over and above, and incorporates the the issues and and approaches that um, we want, we hold near and dear uh, that um, those are back in effect. Yes, and maybe we could get a couple of the former roads committee folks to join us at the next meeting. That would be great. This is, this is Pam. I'm just going to chime in. Just remember that you know the the state does have the standards, and there may be some things within the state standards that may conflict with the CALA standard. Well, the state, if we were going to if we were going to do these last time, Pam, we got them approved by the state before the municipal roads general permit came out. That's all I'm saying. So yeah. that that municipal roads general permit is now, you know, that's law. And so, you know, just just I haven't read through both to compare and contrast or anything like that, but um, just know that 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 that's something that you know somebody should yeah. look into and just make sure yeah well we can maybe ask the members current members or remaining members of the roads committee to look at the municipal roads general permit standards and see what they say john and sharon uh well again my suggestion was that to the extent they don't that provisions of the road stands cows road standards are not in conflict but are additive that that those that we adopt them with the caveat that the state road standards where in conflict um, hold precedence. Um, there's a lot more to them than what the state standards uh, are involved. We we talk about uh, mowing and seeding and, and things that are beyond the stormwater issues and invasives and all that kind of jazz. So. Okay. As a general matter, I think what we're saying is when where our standards augment, it's where we are more more, more conservative. Is that depend I guess that depends on what your perspective is on what is conservative and what is not. But um, I what I wanna say out loud is is I hope that it's the sentiment of the board, even though we're not um, taking the vote and passing a document tonight that we are not 
fully endorsing of the state's rules. So that's that's one thing <coughs> I'm understanding of this discussion is that we have a sentiment, even though we're not in a position to endorse it because that matters in terms of direction for Alfred. But the other thing is, um, I don't know to what extent we're those road standards that we had in place would address the tree health issue that was brought to my attention and and i i just don't i want i want to see alfred i, I hope to pick up the phone tomorrow and talk to stephanie and say stephanie i heard it's like board meeting there's some concern that our road maintenance practices are killing trees and gosh i don't want that to happen educate me so we can do some things where possible so can I ask a question here? Yeah. Um, which which tree? Where where are the trees that are uh, supposedly affected by the roads? So I. It must be a specific spot that that brought this all up again. Actually, I had the opportunity with the townsperson who raised it with me to to go and look at trees all over lots of different places in town. That and it's not just old trees. I started with saying, well, old trees and the old trees die. Um, I, in, in fact, somewhere on my phone, I think I have pictures of even young trees that appear to, to be really challenged or even dead. So, so you can go and look in Lightning Ridge. That's a place to start, but you'll see the same thing in other places in town. Didn't and, it's not, and it's something that has happened recently? Or is this something that's been going on for years? Or, I mean, I just don't understand why it's being brought up all of a sudden. It must be something that has, that has blossomed or something that has just happened recently. Oh, I mean, I don't know. I'm just, that's why I'm asking. I don't know uh, why it's coming up again all of a sudden because we've been using the same practices that we have been right along. And I, I would just like to know why the trees are dying, or if it is the roads, I would like some some proof that it is the roads that's killing these trees. I mean, mm -hmm. it seems like the roads take the blame for everything, and uh, it's not necessarily so. John, so I would love I would love to take a field trip and look at some of these trees, so I could I could share that that evidence I, and I, form my own opinion. I think that's the idea, Alfred. We want the conservation commission to get together with you and with a tree expert, not us, not you, not maybe even everyone on the conservation commission, but the state tree expert. My understanding is there's at least a specter of uh, blame, uh, the finger of blame being pointed toward um, our use of chloride, which is slang for calcium chloride, which is a salt. And as we know, salt kills broadleaf trees, most definitely. Um, it's why uh, on the paved roads of Vermont, you will not see a single maple tree, um, except way back or up on a hillside, the chloride is, uh, kills them. Well, no, that's, that's road salt. That's different when you're talking in pavement, it's road salt. Chloride is a, calcium chloride is a salt. I understand that. I'm not arguing that point. I'm just saying that with calcium chloride, we're only applying it maybe once or twice a summer. On the on the paved roads, they're applying it three or four times a day in the winter time. So okay. there's very much different. I I I I'm not disagreeing with you. I, I know we we use right. calcium chloride must much much le much less often, but. There is a concern. So we'll, let's find out from an expert. They might say, nah, that ain't what's going on. It's something else. Maybe it's the pear trip or something. We don't know, but it would be good to know so that when we get the phone call, we can respond and say, well, it's not the chloride or it's not whatever we're doing. It's something else that we have, we're de addressing differently. So let me ask a question. Maybe somebody here knows the answer. We did, we had a tree inventory done um, via the state, I think it was Joanne Garten, to, to look at the ash trees, you know, because of the emerald ash borer. I wonder if there is somebody at the state or CVRPC that could go and do some drive arounds and look at the tree health 
and give us a report that might help us get started with what the problem is that we're trying to fix. Does anybody think that makes sense? Is that something that Stephanie would know the answer to your question of weather? Yeah, she might, I can ask her. Um, like I said, she was gonna try to be on tonight, but she must still not be feeling well. Pam, do you know, is there anybody at CVRPC that does this? I mean, we could definitely do some kind of inventory driving around and looking. We are not foresters though, nor are we, um, you know, experts in uh, tree damage. So it might be good to um, involve the folks who have helped us develop, you know, the ash tree inventory. Right. Um, see what they might think, because that's really, you know, we, we got, um, you know, guidance from them. We do do ash tree inventories for the towns now. Uh, we have no problem doing that. Um, it's, but in terms of, you know, all the different kinds of tree species that, that are out there and what might affect them, um, I wouldn't feel comfortable um, having that, um, you know, being out in the field and trying to figure that out. I wonder, Neil, um, Neil, who's on the commission, he's on the commission. He's a forester. Right. So um, I think he would be a great first person to talk to about this um, since he is on the Conservation Commission. And Drew, and Drew, I, Drew and Lamb I think, is also. Yeah. And then also, yeah, Drew too. And then, you know, also reaching out to um, Forest Parks and Rec. Um, I'd be happy to, um, for you know, just relay this to Ashley Andrews um, mm -hmm. in our office to see, you know, if, if, uh, anybody at Forest Parks and Rec would be um, a good resource for us. And then we could easily develop um, an app to go out and do some kind of inventory. Like right. I'm just that thinking that the right. funding for that would come from, and that's the other thing, because the ash well, tree inventory came from, you know, from an emergency management. Yeah. And this isn't really yeah. going to well, um, apply with that type of funding. Well, I'm thinking that maybe we want to have some type of report before we get people back together and say, how can we fix this? Maybe we need to know what we're looking at as problems. Select board, does, would, that make, does that make sense? I was, just, I was just gonna throw out um, the county forester is Dan Singleton. Yes. And he lives right here in Callis. He might be a resource too. Good point. Cliff, John, you, Sharon, I see everybody's shaking their heads, okay. So let's let's do that as our plan. Um, well, do we do we want Sh Sharon's taking the initiative on this? Do we want to delegate that to Sharon? Let her. I, yeah. well, to... I, I was just going to ask what it is. To I, me, I... to me, it is contacting, as um, Pam and Rose. Pam said she would talk to somebody in her office. Rose suggested. Um, Dan Singleton, our county forester, maybe it's contacting all of these variety of people and seeing if we can do some kind of an inventory. Would you be willing to take the lead on that? Sure. Katie, did you get the names? I wasn't taking notes on the names. Yeah. Okay, great. All right. Um, we now have... Sandra waiting to give us an update on um, our budget. We need to sign the Sullivan and Powers engagement letter for auditing services and get an update on the tax sales. We're running behind schedule. Jay Copping is waiting to talk with us about um, the public meetings at the town hall during the pandemic. I asked him as our health officer to join us. So Sandra, you're up. Jay, are you still able to kind of hang on? You got to unmute Jay to answer our question. You should be able to just press down your space for Jay to unmute and just hold it down while you're speaking. Maybe he stepped away. Um, Let me try this.
Oh, he sent me a, a, a chat. This is Jay, not able to hear anything yet. He was having troubles getting his audio connected. He was working for a while. It might be on it. Okay, I just, I just sent him back a message asking him if he can hear us now. So Sandra, you wanna get started? Sure. So I sent a um, June report or year end report and the end of year looks very good. And yeah. summer, it, yeah. Uh, to summarize, it, we need to summarize quickly. We ended with an unaudited um, balance or fund balance hang on of $379,676, which is over our opening fund balance by $68,600. So this, uh, we ended up the year in a very good position to get to um, our tax collection time and also to be able to manage um, highway and other grant expenses that are going to be uh, in play during this early part of the fiscal year. Uh, expenses weren't the, we were under uh, budget and expenses by a little, what really pulled us out was um, revenues that were in excess of what budgeted or anticipated. So uh, that is all good news. Highway also ended on a high note. Um, they had expenses over budget, but their grant revenues um, saved the day for them. And in the end, they had roughly $4,600 to roll over into the capital equipment fund. Uh, just of note, the capital equipment fund it has a current balance of a little over $30,000. We are going to um, be short for a $40,000 payment that a lease payment that we need to make in January. Uh, so the difference between what we have in that highway fund um, and what is owed on that lease payment will be an unbudgeted expense to the highway FY21 budget. Just uh, Alfred is aware of that. It's something that just is what it is. Not every year are we going to have um, a lot of money rolling over into that capital, into the highway capital equipment fund, which actually begs the question, perhaps the select board might consider uh, if we're going to continue to use the capital equipment fund as a basis for um, lease payments, we might really consider putting an appropriation right into the highway budget uh, every year to fund that capital equipment fund. Um, and we'll never know if they'll have more money than uh, expenses. You just can't see it at the beginning of any fiscal year, but at least it would be an amount of money that we can count on being in there. Uh, I think that really hits the highlights. And I, does anyone have any questions? Because I can go right into the delinquent tax report. I know we're running. You, uh, I, I just, late. you wanted, Sandra, you wanted confirmation that we decided to not purchase the chipper. Yeah, the, the select board was very clear that they were not going to make any downward adjustments to the budget in uh, their June 22nd board meeting. However, the issue was raised and a soft decision seemed to be made on whether or not we were going to raise, uh, to keep the $25,000 in for the chipper. So that is... Um, a question that the board needs, I think, to answer tonight. We are ready to set a tax rate. We have a grand list. We have our educational rates. And what I need uh, to go 
um, to go forward with setting the FY21 tax rate is a set budget. And that chipper piece is the only one that still is floating. So I would ask the board to make a decision on that tonight. And along those lines, I'd also um, ask the board to make a, to set a date to set the tax rate. I think it's easier for the board if you have a, that as a one item, uh, one agenda item meeting, and perhaps even a special meeting. I would need about a, between a week and a week and a half to feel uh, that I have a solid, confident numbers. I work those numbers several times to make sure that uh, there are no mistakes on that. And uh, you know, really, we could set a tax rate e at half an hour early of your next meeting or any time before July 30th, which would put us in very good position to get those tax bills out on or about the same time we got them out last year. John? So to be clear, getting to the chipper, uh, Sandra, we need to decide because if we decide not to purchase the chipper, that would the cost of that chipper, the twenty-five thousand dollars that was allocated to that line item, would be removed from the budget, and the property tax assessment, the property tax rate, would be adjusted accordingly. Thus, you need to know that tonight, right? I do. I do. And I need to have, we need to have a budget number. And so that chipper, that refresh your memory, is a, it was a loan and the payment that would be coming out of the FY21 budget would be roughly $7,000 and a little more. So that, that's actually what you would be, uh, you would be pulling the chipper out and you would be reducing the budget voted at town meeting by about $7,000. Now, we've already had the discussion of what one cent on the list, how, the, how one cent on the list affects uh, tax rate. That's a very small, budget item, we're not taking out 25,000, we're just taking out the loan payment we were authorized to take the loan. So that's, um, so I need to know that. And you don't have to decide that while I'm on, but that should be, I'm asking that that be a discussion and a decision tonight so we can get that straight done. I vote we buy the chipper. So to be clear, uh, Sandra, eight, seven or eight thousand dollars is much, much less than a penny on the tax rate, right? Uh, Twenty-one thousand was about a penny on the tax rate, so it's about a third of a penny. Third and of a penny. 20, and so at twenty-one thousand and a proper and a property with an assessed value of $200,000 would save roughly $20. So this is a third of that 21,000. What would they save? A third, of, and these are all rough numbers because they're based on um, the grand list on FY20, but we're talking maybe $7. John, am I remembering correctly that we, we talked about not purchasing because we had some this am i remembering that we had a uh, maybe a lead or a suggestion that that we would do better by renting or something all something alternative right, right. Correct. Irene, yeah. yeah i was just going to say the same thing sharon i Good thought i remember job. john saying that he had checked something out of something about hiring yeah somebody to so, do the but, shipping right so I uh, actually, subsequent to the last time we discussed this, since we discussed this last, I spoke with Brent Lilly, who's the operations manager at Washington Electric Co-op. And it was suggested by his dad, farmer Doug Lilly, that 
we actually could probably hire a crew for 125 bucks or whatever it was an hour and we would actually no yeah right 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 finish um alfred is correct he got the answer no way um because that yeah it might cost weck you know 175 an hour three men and a chipper and all this stuff but they're under contract with a company and it works out to that rate and it, they have a commitment you know spring to fall um we these people aren't just hanging out there waiting for a phone call like the culligan man uh from Callis to come in and chip. They're busy in the summer. They're booked a year ahead of time. Uh, so that, that is not something that is even with close to the range of reality, realm of reality. Um, I, I, the original plan was to try to get that chipper in the spring. There were a bunch of them out there. Um, I would dare say that there's less opportunity now and we might not be able to get something like that. Uh, and I also know that a lot of this kind of equipment, because of the COVID-19 situation, there are a lot of people either with time on their hands or are doing you know, private work because they can't work in an office because of the proximity issues or they've been laid off. And so that every single dealer is sold out of all this stuff from tractors to chippers to everything. So, um, if it were there in the, as a budget item, we left it in there, it would be an, op, an option um, if Alfred could find one uh, or we could collectively find one. It might be an opportunity, it might avail itself. It may be that we're unable to, despite putting that in the budget, find one at the price we were could have gotten one for in March. I think that would have been the case anyway, but I think it's been exacerbated by the current circumstances. Yeah, finding that equipment said, is hard. Given the tiny, tiny, tiny amount, I th really think it has almost no effect on the tax base. I think we should just leave it in and see, see, try our luck. But I don't think we should just say, well, we couldn't find one for 25, so let's spend 50. It was made clear to the taxpayers we were shooting around the $25,000 mark, yeah. and that is still remains the mark. That's that's the contingency. Yeah. That $7,000, $8,000 loan amount would be uh premised upon can we katie can i ask that you um review what read it out loud or not but the detail on the process we went through so doug doug brought to us John it thoroughly talked to brent and found that what works for washington electric co-op isn't going to work for us and i would really like to have the details of that in the minutes because we're all going to be called on to tell that story again and i want to make sure the facts are available yes it would be that would be great katie yeah and, and to be clear i spoke with brent directly and he said nah that's not an option for you put that dad, in. dad that you're would wrong. be good to have that in the minutes as well yeah and he said that in front of dad while they were fixing their round baler their hay baler okay. stuff. all right very good so we're leaving it in is that everybody in agreement? Yes. Okay. That was All right, story. Sandra, anything else on budget? Wait, Rose. Rose, oh, Rose. Rose, do you agree? So, yeah, so is who's going to go shopping for a chipper? Who's going to look about availability? Is John going to do that or is Alfred going to do that? Seems Greg like Peltuck. that. Say what? Greg Pelchuk. <laughs> oh, you know he would find it. It might yeah. be in Missouri, but he'd find it. That would work. Yeah. Do you want him to do it? Sure. If he wants okay. to, as long as he's clear on the budget, and that's got to, and the budget includes getting it here. Right. It's okay. got to. It's got to be the whole package. Okay. The, the voters I'll drive to Missouri. I'll they drive to Missouri. <laughs> <laughs> the voters authorized up to a twenty-five thousand dollar loan. And since we don't, we're not going to have any money in the uh, capital equipment fund. We're pretty much. Um, we need to stay with that number. Yes, ma'am. All right. Um, delinquent taxes. Where is my report? I think delinquent taxes look very promising. Even I mean, we have them, certainly. But the 
issues surrounding the delinquencies this year seem um, not as daunting as in previous years. I sent around a, a NIMRIC full report on every taxpayer, and then I did a spreadsheet um, on nine taxpayers with amounts of taxes uh, that total $30,915. And these taxes for all intents and purposes are uh, well over $1,000. So there are, there are three taxpayers who really have, I have questions about. I doubt that any of them will end up going to tax sale, but uh, I think maybe they could end up being collected by Gloria Rice. The other uh, parcels, two, three, four, six, and seven, they have all either on a payment plan, one is on a payment plan, and the others have simply committed to paying by August. And what we have discussed is that you know, they missed their deadline of June 30th. Um, everybody has a situation to talk about. August 15th or so is roughly when I'm anticipating letting the tax bills fly for, 20, uh, for this tax year, uh, 2020. And what I said to them is the preference is that it's all paid in full by August 15th. The new bills are coming out, but they have to be paid, have to be paid by November 15th or that there is no payment plan available. That's the end. We're not going to have last year's taxes <clears throat> outstanding after the deadline for this year's taxes. That that policy and that <clears throat> uh, and that practice that the board has had for the last two or three years has been very very effective in keeping the tax uh, the delinquent taxes to a bare minimum. Um, so I, I, I think we have a reasonable expectation of everybody paying. Now, number five may end up requesting an, abate, an abatement uh, based on illness. Um, and that the intent of that particular parcel owner is questionable to me at this point in time, I'm not sure the family circumstance and the promise to pay after the tax refund it, it was in, um, I, I don't know if that's gonna be kept. So that that is a possible abatement situation there, but otherwise I think we're gonna, I think we're gonna get them all. And I think we're gonna get most of them in by mid August. So there you are. Well, thank you very much for all your hard work on that. Nice, nice, nicely done. It it went much better than I thought this year. Um, yeah. I I I I'm I'm, ha I'm happily surprised. So um, currently, your yeah. outstanding um, delinquent taxes are 2019 taxes only, and they're just a titch in excess of thirty two thousand dollars. I think that is a real uh, that's a real positive end to FY20. Right. Perfect. Um, anybody have any questions on the delinquent tax report? If not, oh, Cliff? You're muted. <laughs> yeah, it's not uh, working the way it's supposed to right now, but I think I'm unmuted now. Yeah. Sandra, I was just curious, we had the uh, tax sale, did those properties get uh, reconciled prior to the closing of the tax sale? One of the parcels paid in full uh, the, at the 11th hour to Gloria Rice directly, there was no tax sale. The second uh, parcel did go to tax sale and uh, we are holding um, the proceeds for the redemption period. Now, this same parcel went to tax sale two years ago, and on you know the eleventh hour, the owner did redeem the property. 
So I suspect we're going to see that again this year. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, we need to do the Sullivan and Powers um, contract. Any comments, Sandra, on that? No, that's their standard letter agreement. And we are ready to go with them. Uh, the audit will take place on July 23rd and 24th. That's a Thursday and a Friday. We will be closing the office to all business on Thursday and Friday for the audit. Um, I am hoping to keep our, there's usually two of them, sometimes three of them come in. And I'm hoping to keep, you know, to not have too many hours with the four of us working in the office together. They will have a hard time social distancing. They set up their computers around that long table and they're, it's just not, um, th th they're gonna have to figure that out. Hopefully we can do some of the information exchange by um, uh, digitally. Oh, that would be I'm nice. Sure, yeah, I'm sure they're, uh, as concerned for them, I'm sure they are as concerned for their own safety um, in this matter. And uh, I think, I, I hope we can do it that way. Anyway, maybe, that, they that's won't, maybe they won't send three given the size of the office. Um, well, then this would be their third or fourth time here, third time, I guess. And I'm hoping that they won't. I'm hoping they'll send two. We have a pretty good relationship and I have accumulated, uh, I'd say three quarters, maybe more of the FY20 documents that they're gonna be asking for. So um, we're ready for them. I'm just, uh, we'll have to see. We'll have to see what their comfort level is. They really did want to come in. That's yeah. the thing. It's easier for them to come in and do it that way. And if they didn't, that means you would have to be scanning a lot of stuff and sending it to them? Yeah, I would still need to be, I would still need to be in the office um, in communication with them and scanning as they would ask. Okay. Well, we'll, you know, we'll figure out that process. I know they are doing audits right now uh, in other towns. So they have, um, they have practice in, in working around the uh, social distancing situation. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm guessing that they are starting to perfect it by this time. And Cliff, do you, can you call up the contract? Sullivan and Powers contract. And yes, this is we have here. we have budgeted enough money for the cost, correct, Sandra? Yes. All right. So it's it's basically the same contract we've had in other years, correct, Sandra? Yes. Okay. And do we all need to sign? Do we need to sign anything? Or I, I think, I there's, think a, there's, there's a signature page somewhere. Yeah, and I I, I think that uh, if the board gives one of its members authority to sign on its behalf, and that is reflected in the minutes as a motion, that that would be that that should be acceptable in particular under the yeah. situation. Oh, no, see, it looks like it's got, it looks like it's got us all signing this. Yeah. So we can do the same thing. I can, um, I can't right now, but I could, <laughs> later I could print off the signature page and leave it at the office for folks to sign. What, what's the turnaround time to get this to them? It needs to be there before the 20, well before the 23rd. So in the next, you know, week it should get there. I think okay. they're counting, they're, they're expecting it to be in. They're not sitting on pins and needles wondering if they're going to come at, on the 23rd. They're expecting okay. it to come, yeah. And it, won't, they, and it won't slow, and it won't slow up the dates of when they're planning to come Oh, no, we, we set this date a year ago. Okay. That, in great, order great. to get into their schedule. Yeah. All right, so I would make a motion. Oh, Sharon, I'm sorry. Yeah, instead of, 
instead of we all drive to the town office to sign it for a wet signature, can we just sign these things, you know, one at a time through print and sign and scan back to everybody or back in a rotation or something? So that actually I could sign everything from my office. You know what I mean? I can't. I don't have a printer here, so, but whatever works for everyone else, I mean, I can drive to your office or something, Sharon, I could go to town or something, I don't know. Well, it could, it could, once it's all, once once those of us who have access to that have done it, it could go to the town office to get printed and left in the, in the. Entry. I can, I, I can do like I just did with the other document, but Cliff wanted to say something. Sharon, are you, uh, I believe Denise is going to email you the right of way document that we discussed earlier yep. with the conditions. You're going to print that out, sign it, and leave it at the office tomorrow by 9 a.m.? I am, but what I'm suggesting is that we adopt a different practice where we don't have to all, I mean, I, I personally cannot be driving to the town office three or four days a week to sign stuff. Yeah, well, and I, I don't, just thinking I don't, if you're... I was just going to say, if you're doing it for the right of way document, you could do it for this document as well. Just print it out and drop it off. And I agree with you. We should try and find another way to do this, but in the interest of getting these two going. That's, that's fine. I, but I, yeah, as a, this is, we're going to be in this environment for, for who knows how long. So, so <coughs> unless a wet signature is required. Um, yeah, and I don't think we're driving to the office three or four days a week, but I think a better way of doing it is something we should do. So I can print off the signature page and scan it and send it to Sharon so she has it by tomorrow morning or tonight, I guess you want it by, right? That would be great. I'm still in the office now. If I can start that process. And John wants to say something too. Um, yeah, so... Uh Maybe, and this is like Cliff's bailiwick, <laughs> um, maybe we could explore a license for the select board members. There's a, uh, I don't know if they call it the professional, but the, the higher grade Adobe Acrobat license <coughs> allows you to convert to Word and, and add signatures and, and generally uh, amend a document by adding a signature. And if we had that program on our individual computers, we wouldn't have to print it out and rescan it. We could just, you could have a, a picture file of your signature. I do, uh, I add it to Word documents, but I do not add, have the ability to add it to a PDF document. And it's not worth it for me to buy an individual <laughs> license, but maybe there's a, a business license or something for that, <laughs> that would save us there's all. There's a a lot of effort. There's a low level um, Adobe uh, license you can buy that's pretty inexpensive. It's an annual. It allows you to convert um, Adobe documents into Word. It's not always perfect, but I believe also uh, for those of us running Office 365, I think that version of Office has that capacity as well. Um, there is also a low level license you can purchase that creates the ability to do electronic signatures. There are other applications out there that uh, do the same thing. I, I can, I'll be happy to research those and see what's going to be most cost effective. It could be okay. as simple as a Dropbox license. That would be a good idea. Okay, Thank you. I'll make a note to look into that. You're Thank you. Okay, so would somebody like to make a motion to approve the Sullivan and Powers contract for? Um, the audit. I had one more quick question for Sandra about the cost of the contract. Yes, go ahead. Sandra, I I recall that um, they gave us a either two or three year um, thing for doing the audit at the same cost. Are we still within that or by doing this new contract, we're on a new amount or something. I don't really remember the details, but can you uh, refresh my memory on that? Um, we initially signed a contract for FY 16, 17, and 18. Okay. And then uh, 
we signed a three-year contract for 19, 20, and 21. And let's see, this year may have stayed the same. Hang on for a quick second. I think it went up maybe by $500 a year up once or twice. Let me, let me look. Professional audit. Here we are. So in FY 19, 16, 17, FY19 was, <clears throat> pardon me, 14,000. FY20 was 14.9, and FY21 was also 14.9. So it's the same cost as last year, or as last fiscal year. So we're locked in on the amount we pay, but we still have to sign this annual contract to perform the audit? Like they're two different things? Well, yeah, they, they have offered us a, a a sweetener by hooking up with them for three years. And this letter okay. simply describes the scope of services. And you know, what, okay. Fred, Thank what you. Fred Plessy said is, look, if you guys decide you're not gonna do a year or something like that, he, as far as he's concerned, he, he's not gonna sue us for performance or anything. It would just go out the window. That's not the way they do business, but that is a way to encourage us to continue to be their customer. And they've been pretty reasonable in their uh, increases. They haven't, there really hasn't been much of an increase over the last six years or six fiscal years. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you for Sandra. I have a quick Thank question. You. Um, there's somebody on by an iPhone. Could you please tell us who you are? This is Brooke Dingle. Jean. I'm an oh, attorney. hi, Brooke. Hey, how you doing? Hi, Brooke. Okay. Um, are you, is, I, I can't now remember. Did somebody make a motion, Katie? Okay. I'll make a motion that we approve the um, engagement letter for the um, fiscal year 20 audit with Sullivan and Powers as outlined by Sandra. Okay, I'll Maybe second that. Fiscal year 21. Fiscal year 21 audit. Right, we're already doing the, the 20, this contract is for 21 audit, not 20. Right. Okay, fiscal year 21 audit. Okay, and I seconded it. Are you ready to vote? Cliff? Aye. Rose? Aye. Sharon? Aye. John? Aye. And I'm an aye. All righty, thank you, Sandra. Um, One last thing. Yes, ma'am. We wanna set that date to set the tax rate. That, can, that should can be we done. Do it at, can we do it at 6.30 on the 27th? Can board members be available at 6.30? Cliff? Rose? I don't, I don't know, but if I'm not, if everybody else is there, I'm fine. Okay, Sharon? Sharon? What day John? is it? It's our, it's our regularly scheduled Monday meeting on July 27th, just starting at 6.30 instead of 7. Oh, yeah, that works. Okay. Sharon, does that work for you? Yeah. All right. Can, that can we have you, that? Sandra? <laughs> yeah, that'll work for me as well. Can that be the top? That Can that be at the top of that 6.30 agenda? Yeah, I, that's, what we're, that's why we're meeting. Nice that's why we're meeting at 6.30 just to do that. Okay, great. Okay. Sounds good. All right, thank you. Wait, stop. You, One yes, last anything, thing. Anything else? The FEMA, um, FEMA is open for uh, submitting expenses. We have a little over $3,300. So we have met the threshold. <coughs> the 
question for the board remains, do we want to submit those expenses now? We anticipate any other expenses. If we submit them now and we have additional expenses, we must meet that $3,300 threshold once again, if it's during the same uh, event. So I am holding paper on 3,300, almost 3,350, and it has not been submitted. I think it's a board decision whether or not to, to submit now and understand that any additional expenses will not be reimbursable if they don't meet a $3,300 threshold. And that and this event is going to probably close at some point. Now there's no rumor that it's closing anytime soon, but it won't be open um, indefinitely. So we don't have a, a date by which <coughs> we have to decide that we may have some additional expenses depending on what we decide to do with use of the hall or not. Well, I just don't want the board to lose sight of it because right, no, just keep reminding us. Yeah, yeah, we 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 want to keep that uh, on. We we want to we want not to forget that. All right, I am. Wait a minute. Uh, I think Cliff did. I, Cliff, I didn't wasn't sure. Do you have a question? I just wanted to say that I can tell you, Sandra. Absolutely, we anticipate having additional expenses we are at a point where we're probably going to have to expand our uh, zoom license um and zoom, but zoom i've asked is <laughs> there i've asked before and zoom is not reimbursable no okay then the other one that uh we just discussed uh regarding the acrobat licensing that's probably not going to be eligible as well but we do imagine incurring some expenses for um when we come up with our policy for use of the town hall, there'll be some items that we're going to have to purchase and have in place there. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Anything else for Sandra before she leaves or before she stays? Oh, I can leave. All, all right. right. Thank you. Well, thank you all very much. Have a good night. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Okay, Jay, are you on? Jay, I don't see him. Um, let me try calling him at the station. Or see if he can uh, call into one of the numbers. Yeah, because he can call in, right? He doesn't have to be on in Zoom. Yep. He's on, but it's not responding, I guess. Yeah, I think he can hear us, but I don't think he can speak to us. Hi, can you can't? Okay, you then why don't you call in? You can call in. Can you call from the um, fire station phone? Right, Cliff. Which Cliff? Which number should he call? Chicago or New York? New York. Okay, if you go into the calendar and um, call in the, the New York number, it's a toll-free number. Okay, and don't forget, don't forget, you're going to need the meeting ID or password probably. Okay, all right, thanks, Jay. Cliff, while we're waiting to see for Jay to call in. Um, Maybe we could quickly do IT update and the reason why the office is closed. That should only take a couple minutes. Hey, Denise, sorry to interrupt. Are you done with me or? Um, I believe so. Unless any, does anybody have a reason for Alfred to stay on? Um, oh, wait a minute. This is Pam. Oh, yeah, the East Calus. Um, Alfie, do you want to stay on for the to talk about the stormwater stuff? I hate to keep you, but um, uh, sure, okay. sure, I can wait. I just, I okay. guess I forgot about that, but yeah, I can wait. Thanks. Okay, Cliff, John, you wanted to say something? Well, not n nothing urgent. I can actually talk to Alfred offline about it. Okay, Cliff. 
Server okay, migration so, the reason the office is closed? Yes, it's the final bit of transfer. We've kind of been running with the the original server, the backup server. Uh, the new one is in place, but now there's a final bit of data transfer that has to happen. Um, but more importantly than that, what is going to be going on tomorrow is a lot of testing to make sure that there are no other hiccups. So once they resume normal business on Wednesday, uh, they'll have already overcome any issues that they might encounter. And now, they've I actually see already started working on it as we meet here. Did I see something where they were actually going to start it tonight? Yeah, they're working on it right now. Okay. I was hoping it wasn't going to affect our Zoom meeting, but I guess it doesn't. No, it doesn't. This is really more about impact upon uh, NIMRIC and the files that the office staff maintains. Okay. Jay, are you on yet? No, he's not. Okay, let's give them a couple more minutes. Maybe we could do the memorandum of agreement. This is a project that's been in the works for what, two years, Pam? Yeah, well, it was uh, in in the thought processes back in 2017. So it's almost yeah. three years now. So, <laughs> but we have, so this is, um, you want me to just give the you want me to just give the background here, Denise? If you can do it, yeah. If you can be quick. yeah. Just um, the, the uh, this is a memorandum of agreement between CVRPC and the town to um, help facilitate the project for the final designs of the stormwater uh, mitigation at the East Callis Post Office and the Moscow Woods Road Gully. So. Um, I came and talked to you folks a little while um, ago to um, see if we would submit could submit a grant for this, and everybody said yes, do it. So I submitted the grant, and um, we've got the award. And this is just a memorandum of agreement that CVRPC is going to manage um, the engineer that's been hired, who is um, Malona McBroom, and. Um, you folks, there's just a, a few things that we're going to need from the town to help facilitate the project. And this memorandum of agreement just kind of outlines that. And there is an in-kind match, which is um, outlined in the mem memorandum also, which is about um, $1,200 of in-kind time. And that counts for two projects. So um, when we'll just need um, somebody to kind of um, take responsibility to, um, you know, keep track of those match hours and fill that out. Um, well, the, it, the road crew us. would be the road crew would be doing those that work, right? Yeah, and and then the other part to um, just authorize in the memorandum is to is for Alfie um, and crew if the engineers need any test pits dug or anything like that. Um, for them to help out with that and if they could use their own or you know the town equipment to do so that the equipment use and the um, labor time counts as match too but also if we you know if the um the the engineers are also going to want to come and talk to you throughout the process and show you you know the designs at different stages and your time to listen to the engineers counts as match as well so um, that's all kind of outlined in the memorandum, like what we want to kind of, you know, include folks in the process of, you know, 60%, 90% design. So, will you be, will you be periodically checking in on this project, visiting the yep. site? I'm sorry, yep. what? Yes, I will be. Yeah, I'll be, you know, I'll be visiting the site and um, uh, working with the engineers on and uh, with the designs and the feasibility and the landowners as well, who is uh, John Reese and um, the Recreation Association as well. So um, that's, the, that's the gist of it, but there is some town involvement with the match. So that's what this memorandum is all about. And also just kind of authorizing and making sure that Alfie and crew um, can participate. Alfred, do you have any questions? 
Uh, no, not at all. I'm I'm more than happy to help. Uh, I'm assuming they're going to do test holes fairly soon. Is that correct? Yep. As soon as they can. Um. Uh, as soon as we have, we do have. Um, just have to get the contract signed with them, which we do have already, and they're already working on things, but they haven't um, let me know yet about any dates that they're going to be out there to to dig the test holes. But we'll let you know. And we just wanted okay. to have this signed as well, but with you folks before we would move forward with that. Okay, so it looks yeah. like it needs, it, does the select board have any questions or comments? Everybody good? Would somebody like to make a motion to approve the memorandum of agreement and authorize me to sign it? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Okay, um, we'll, we'll vote. Ro uh, Cliff? Aye. Sharon? Aye. Rose? Aye. John? Aye. And I'm an aye. All right, so should I just sign the signature page and send it back to you? Yep, that would be great. All right, very good. Thank, Thank you, Pam. You. Thank you so much. Thanks. Have a good Thank night, everybody. Pam. Pam. Thank you. Take care. All right, Jay, are you on now? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Oh, yes, we can hear you. Oh, my Yay. God. Yay. There are miracles. All right. So thank you for agreeing to join us. Um, sure. you mentioned, um, I, this is a, not on the agenda, but I just wanted to let the board know what you found out about water testing at Curtis Pond. Mm -hmm. um, I had spoken. Well, I actually didn't speak with anybody uh, on the uh, Health Department's lab site, uh, they're pretty clear that uh, many things, and it's, and it's on their site, you can see what they're testing and what they're not testing. One of the things they're not testing are, are swimming holes, swimming pools, lakes, and that sort of thing. Uh, I, I think if a situation arose where somebody was swimming at any of our ponds, someone got ill, and there was a question of what might be in the water, then we might be able to preempt and get a test. I'm not aware of any individual labs. I'm not sure how risky that is to find somebody who might accept a sample and test it. Uh, but at this point, uh, even though they recommend it, they're not testing. So that's kind of where we stand. And I did respond back to one or two towns people who had inquired about that, and they seem satisfied knowing where we are kind of in the world right now. So that's where that piece stands. Okay, well, thanks for checking that out, and thanks for the update. Um, so I had asked Jay to join us to talk about the consideration of reopening the town hall to use for meetings and, and or maybe other events, um, given the current situation. I sent the board, I've done a lot of research, um, asking questions of this agency and that agency. I think I sent you a packet of information of just some of the stuff that I've found on in my journey. Um, and I asked Jay as our health officer, if he would join us and weigh in. So Jay, do you want to tell us? You want me to weigh in? Yeah, if you could. <laughs> so I'll weigh in like I, I did in our conversation last night. I, and I think one of the first questions, and I, and I think I guess you just answered it, the, the main question, concern or issue seems to be do we or do we not open the town hall for various meetings, events, and that sort of thing? Does that sound fair? Yes. Okay. So, you know, I work in healthcare, and, and we're, we're pretty cognizant of, uh, of the cautions that it's out there um, and the things that we're doing to protect ourselves and protect our community members. Um, and some of these conversations obviously trickle down from the governor's office. They, they trickle down from... Uh, what appears to be at least bi-weekly um, meetings from the VLCT and some of their comments on their resource page. Um, I, th I think, as I spoke with Denise last night, you know, I've got my personal feelings on it, but and I think the, the general consensus out there is um, not to do anything like that. Most communities currently are doing uh, technological visits. They're doing Zoom meetings um, and that sort of thing. I know that the uh, League of Cities and Towns encourages select or, or town offices to be open 
to serve the needs, you know, licensing your dog, getting your marriage license, whatever those things might be, as long as we have in place signage at the office, you either do these things by appointments, you do them um, distance, one or two people in there at a time with a distance thing, requiring a mask and that sort of thing. And uh, as Denise and I talked last night, one of the concerns about opening up a public building the current recommendation would be to have it no more than 50% occupancy and to have only one person per 100 square feet. And I'm thinking how much that would limit things. The second problem with that, of course, is getting everybody to comply with distancing, with masking. And then the next problem, of course, is how do you disinfect and, and clean everything out afterwards? So I think there are a lot of considerations in there and a lot of difficulties to doing something like this. Um, and I think most of us in the medical community, and, and it sounds like from the government offices, is um, to, to limit these things until we are better prepared to manage people who come in and, and, and keep everybody safe. And frankly, right now this county is in pretty good shape. And if we can maintain that, we can get through this a little bit quicker. I think if we just open both doors and let folks uh, come barreling in to have various meetings and weddings and whatever else the building might be for, uh, might very well set us back. I just I think there are a lot of issues and concerns there. So that's you, pretty much the gist of it. Yeah. And I sent around a document. I don't know. I think you said you looked at it. CVRPC puts out put out a document that says what other town offices are doing. Um, right. I mean, not other town, other town offices and other boards, committees, commissions, and by and large, for the most part, they're either doing um, Zoom. Some are still doing it by phone. Can't imagine that. Right. Um, but nobody yeah. has, as far as I could look, see, and looking at that chart, nobody had reopened meetings to in person. Yeah, I think that's pretty much true. You know, and 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 trying to be cautious and, and the things were even like playgrounds I think were opened up to a limited degree interestingly enough at the end of June uh, provided that there is signage to what they need to do uh, you can't be sick when you're there you have to wash when you get there wash when you leave and you have to wear a mask and to police all of that uh, and keep everybody safe is difficult and, and understanding that people are grumpy and they want to get things moving onward and so on um, it's just the medical community and, and doctors that I spoke with recently say it's been our best uh, our best feeling is not to do it that it's a bad idea. So I think that's I think that's where we're at with things in the world right now. So yeah, uh, and then you, you, you do have to think that, about the cost of. Well, you mentioned something about the flu season is coming up in addition to. Yeah, well, we don't even want to think we don't even want to think about that you know we start vaccinating in august for the flu and every year we hope that we are hitting the right strain of the virus with the vaccine that we have uh, the two viruses don't cross pollinate if you will um, but once you get ill let's say with one or the other you're susceptible to getting the opposite one i think and you know it becomes more dangerous so you know hopefully there would be a vaccine for the for the COVID-19 sometime in the middle of the you know, December or something. We just, I'm not sure that we've got that yet. And even if we got it in December or November, even we're not going to protect the entire population right away. So we're going to have to be more alert and stay on our toes with how we're caring for ourselves and our loved ones. And, um, you know, just the, member, the general members of the public out there. Do you know if it's mandatory to take, I, there's mandatory questions that you have to ask and you have to do, have names mm -hmm. and contact information. Do you know if it's mandatory to do the temperature check? You know, there's been conversation about that and I think they're trying to make a decision on that actually in the next couple of weeks. Uh, that's the latest that I've heard on that. Um, you know, you can have this virus and, and not actually have the fever to start off with. You can have the virus as you probably know and not show any symptoms at all. So temperature check is a minor thing, and I think that might lead them to sort of backing down on that a little bit. I think on the other hand, you might catch people who have a fever or even a low grade that might 
spur us to pay a little closer attention to that individual. Um, signing in for meetings, you know, like if somebody's in your office, they should sign in with their name and, and their contact information so that if anything happens, we can trace it back. Um, and that is still being required uh, of places. So that does still stay into effect. The temperature thing, again, I, I I know they're talking about that, and it's quite possible that they'll relax on that, um, yeah, I would say, within the next two to four weeks. But, you know, everything is so subject to change right now. Yeah, it seems to change quite frequently. Mm -hmm. So, select board members, would you have, do you have any questions for Jay, Cliff? Uh, not really. I, I think, uh, Jay, once I want to echo Denise and say thank you for joining us. Um, pretty much confirmed everything that I've suspected um, and also um, gives us some other information we can take back to the community as people are continuing to inquire about use of the hall. Um, so yeah, yeah and I no think one of the important, so, thank you. I do think one of the important things is if our community members are calling the select officers, they're calling to town office and whatever, uh, just to reassure them what we do is in their best interest and that they can still conduct business, um, you know, in the proper fashion based on the guidelines we've been following for the last several months and, you know, try not to get people grumpy. But, um, you know, I've been living with a mask for several for several months now. And it, although it's irritating, um, it's second nature at this point. Granted, it's it's my daily work <laughs> eight hours a day. But, um, you know, it should be the same for all of us, no matter where we go. So. Okay, Sharon. Um, Jay, hi. Thanks for being here. Um, I would like to just ask that we have Jay come back in. Maybe two meetings is is too close. Although, uh, but whatever the third meeting from now is, just so we build a rapport and a relationship and regular check-ins, because as every as Jay said, this is not going to. We're with this. This is with us for the long haul. So I think continuing to hear from him and keep him engaged with us right. is really important. Yeah, August August tenth would be our first meeting in August, and there might be some changes by then. Certainly, certainly. Um, um, Rose, yeah, I can try to do that, and certainly any information I get, I would pass on. You know, before a meeting, if there were any changes that uh, other folks might not hear about. Okay, that'd be great. Um, Rose, questions. No, I'm just bummed. Um, you know, I, 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 yeah, I mean, I've been vocal before and, you know, just putting it out there that I just think meeting via Zoom is so inefficient. Um, and, but, you know, we have to do what we do. And, you know, I am thankful that we do not have widespread community COVID. Thanks be to God. Um, I too wear a mask every day. Um, but we need to protect everybody and be safe. So I just want to say hi to my friend Jay and thank you for uh, leading us on this, being our town health officer and look forward to you coming back um, and keeping us updated. Sure. John? You know, the, um, the, the Zoom meet meetings are, are a real pain as we've been trying to get in there on the, on the thing tonight here. Every time I try to do these, it seems like there's a different problem with it. And, and if there are meetings, you know, it, the community can always come in by phone or Zoom. And, you know, it, it, it's, it's a miserable way to meet. I totally agree. But, right, we try to stick it out best we can. Yeah, if yeah. I, much Thank prefer, you. I much prefer face to face. But I also okay. know, as I mentioned, as the home provider for people with special needs in both high risk groups, Jay knows my people because they come to the health center. If I were to come back home and transmit something to them, it could be fatal. Sure. It's proven that way a time or two. So. Yeah. John, any comments or questions for Jay? Oh, I'm, I'm really happy that you were able to take the time and meet with us, Jay. Thank you for sticking around toward the last third of the meeting. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. That's fine. Okay, select board. So what would you like to do about, you want to put this off until we meet again with Jay on August 10th to see where we're at with all of this? Um, what's your pleasure? 
What do you want to What do you want to decide? Can we Can we just note um, that a few weeks ago, when the governor started um, lessening the restrictions and the, uh, allowing us to actually be out and and encouraging social distancing and all that, I think even before all of the the workplace protocols came into place around workplace and other settings, temperature, visitor res registrations, all of that, we were starting to see some in-person meetings happening and, and, and we're really kind of taking a step back from that and recognizing that um, we didn't have all the information then that we have now. We didn't have the clear protocols from the governor that we do now and that we actually in some perceptions might be taking a step back. Well, I think we did have um, an in-person meeting at the town garage where we were very separated. We did an in-person meeting at Maple Corner. Um, and, you know, it was, that was a risk we took. And I'm not sure what continued risks people want to take. I think it's important for us to be leaders, and and if we're if we're if we if we set an expectation that we're going to be conservative for the safety of our community, we need to be. Well, that's why I would not be in favor of the select board, even if we're social distanced with masks. I would not be in favor, as a matter of what's fair to others, for us to meet at the town hall, and and. We wouldn't be letting people in. They would have to do it by Zoom. Cliff mentioned that there were some technical issues that he could overcome for that. Um, but in a sense of fairness to all the other boards and commissions, people are really, really, really want to use the town hall. And so don't we, because it's beautiful. And we just spent a lot of money fixing it up. Um, I just want to make sure that we're doing the right thing and that we don't put people at risk. John? And thanks for that, Denise. Um, uh, I still think that we could meet uh, as with Cliff doing some upgrading and, and making some arrangements. But given that, but given the larger issue with the use of the town hall and um, the, what you said, Denise, I saw in the end that, uh, that's a point well taken and, and I concur. Okay, so Jay, could you be back with us on August 10th and check in? And in the meantime, you said you would send us information if something significant changes? Right, yeah, I will send you an update. Uh, anything that I find out or hear from uh, the various agencies on, on any of these things and any other guidance or, you know, what the status of the county is, which is always available um, to the the state's health department site anyway but yeah i'd be happy to do that um if things change i'm not uh readily available i'll um, i'll figure it out we'll do something so and and i be great. I, I get these updates every day from vermont emergency management and from the lct and from cbrpc and i do check that information so sure um I'll, i would be happy to see them put something out that said something different than what we currently have. I would love to see that. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. let's cross our fingers. <laughs> All right. Anything else for Jay or should we let him get back to volunteering at the fire department? I'd love to get back to work. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Jay. Thanks, Thanks a lot. Thank Appreciate you. it. Okay. All right. Bye-bye now. Bye. Um, town Hall Cliff. Yeah, I, I think we need to hear something good after that discussion. So I will be happy to let everyone know that the exterior painting, the contractor will begin a week from today, next Monday. Yay! Do we know what color? Uh, we're going to finalize the, the shade of white. Uh, David has that information from John. He's going to communicate it to the uh, contractor and uh, they're still trying to figure out the tone of green that's going to be used in the appropriate areas but uh, that should not stop him from the first phase which is uh, 
doing the lead abatement. And then comes and the primer coat and then comes the final coat. And another reason that we can't use, even if we didn't have COVID right now, while he's doing that lead abatement, isn't he going to have some kind of tent area set up and equipment? Yeah, and it's, a, gonna... it's a pretty involved process. He has to have tarps and um, there has to be running water available. Uh, the dust has to, all these steps he has to take to contain the dust. He has to clean it all up every day and dispose of it properly. Um, so yeah, it, it's best if people aren't there during that phase of it. Uh, but he will have to pause because there is one exception. Um, the primary election scheduled for August 11, we need the town hall to conduct that. And there's a bunch of protocol that's being put in place. Uh, Judy and Barbara have been uh, training on what they'll need to do. It's pretty extensive. Um, Barbara shared some of that with me. Um, so he will break from his work so that the election, the, the primary can take place and then um, he'll go back to work after that. But I, I suspect the lead abatement will be done before that date comes. Any questions? Okay, the other thing that's on the agenda, uh, the, the Friends of Town Hall are doing the revised uh, management agreement, adding some of the language that uh, was requested. So uh, we are meeting on more of a uh, bi-weekly uh, schedule these days. So uh, probably by our next uh, regular select board meeting, we'll have a revised document to put in front of the select board for everyone to review and hopefully sign off on. Yeah, and I mean, there's no huge rush because we can't use no, the facility exactly, anyways. Exactly. In the meantime, they're starting to um, look into Artie and uh, Scott are looking into the uh, formal rental agreement. Um, they have that to show to everybody at some point and also doing research on uh, insurance requirements. And it goes above and beyond the insurance that the town already holds for the town hall. Because if, if we, when we do get to that point where we're able to have um, non-municipal functions going on upstairs, we want to make sure that we have correct insurance in place. Yeah. Um, before we do, I have some, an update on the keypad. Alfred, you said you wanted to have, you wanted to have a chance to leave the meeting. Any, unless you want to, you're welcome to stay, but unless you, Otherwise, you can sign off. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's supper time for me. Yeah, well, there you go. <laughs> Thanks, Alfie. Okay, okay. have so, a good night, all. You all right. too. Take Bye. Care. Um, so I contacted John McCullough, and he is going to be installing the keypad. It's like, it's like the thing that we had at, when we went to Maple Corner. You put in the code, the little thing opens, and a key falls out and it can be reprogrammed with a new code if we're finding that there's some kind of um, too many people accessing the key. So that's, that's the update. Okay, anything else on town hall from anybody? Thank you, Cliff. You're welcome. Okay, um, John, um, excuse, Brooke, are you there? Hi, Brooke. Hello. I'm Hi, sorry. Brooke. I'm trying to get in a place where I can talk. That's okay. Can did you have something you wanted to talk to us about? I don't want to keep you hanging. Or nope, you just? Nope, I'm just listening in. It's, okay. I'll raise my hand if I have anything. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. If, if that's okay. Good, good to almost see you. I know. <laughs> you don't want to see me. You don't want to see me right now. <laughs> right. Oh, uh, okay. Thank you. Um, thank you. All right, John asked me to put an item on for compliance with the open meeting law. So I'll turn this, uh, this over to him. Yeah, thanks, Denise. Um, and, and I asked at quite the last minute because I feel that a complaint or a concern raised by um, a resident, uh, Craig Line contacted me regarding concerns that <clears throat> are, are 
the standards our, our Calistown town boards and committees have been operating by may we may not be operating consistent with the open meeting law um, in particular we have a design advisory board that oversees uh, development or uh, any kind of work done on historic structures within our historic district, which is generally the Kent Corners or the great, Greater Kent Corners Old West Church Historic District. And so we have a, a design advisory board that evaluates any, any construction or any changes to existing construction or, or historic structures for that matter. Um, and it, at the time I was informed by Mr. Line, I had no knowledge, firsthand knowledge that his complaint was true or false or what have you. Um, the design advisory board was allegedly meeting uh, without warning their meetings um, and not holding their meetings as a public forum, but meeting privately. I don't know if that's the right term. Um, and not keeping minutes as required by the law and not posting notices, et cetera. So um, not having that direct knowledge, I actually met with uh, John McCullough, who's um, I guess a de facto member of the DAB. That's the acronym that we use for the Design Advisory Board um, on another matter. And uh, today, late afternoon, and so I asked him firsthand, you know, has the design advisory board been meeting with, um, you know, applicants without noticing those meetings where there was a quorum? And he answered, yes. I asked, has the design advisory board been meeting uh, on projects and reviewing applications and discussing applications or proposals for construction or building amendments without warning those meetings where there's a quorum and the decisions being made. Yes. Have you been keeping minutes? No. Um, and, and all this said, you know, frankly, the D, I guess the longer history is many of our boards over the many uh, years have not been fully compliant, if even compliant at all with um, the open meeting law, the Vermont laws that govern how boards conduct themselves with regard to making themselves available to the public and receptive to public input and commentary, et cetera, on the goings on. Um, and it's been an evolution since I've been on this board. Seems like we tick off one committee, up, uh, not tick off, but tick down the list from one committee to another and have done that in terms of educating them and bringing in the League of Cities and Towns attorney, who's now our attorney, um, educating our board members as to how how the law operates, when it when it and what it's the expectations are. Um, the DAB, John McCullough, um, informs me has never uh, taken into consideration the open meeting law. It's not by any uh, willful intent to evade. Uh, public your discourse, but just how they've always done it. Um, so uh, to that end, I, I brought this to Denise, our chair's attention, and Denise suggested, uh, and this is again before I met with John McCullough, Denise suggested we reach out to Jim Barlow and just confirm kind of our sense that any any of our boards uh, need to comply with the public open meeting law. I'm sorry, the Vermont open meeting law and, um, and whether or not there are any instances where they may be exempt somehow. Uh, I know we had an issue with our roads committee. I came, they came up earlier in our meeting tonight, uh, where they hadn't been warning meetings and taking minutes and all that. And there was some pushback and we had to get tough. Uh, tough love was uh, expressed and, and so now they, they, and I guess if they reconvene, they will follow that. Um, so this is yet uh, part of the evolving education process, I guess, in the town of Callis. But um, Jim Barlow, our 
attorney um, that the town of Callis has on retainer uh, issued an opinion in an email to both Denise and I. Um, and he said in relevant part, the design advisory board is a quote unquote public body subject to the open meeting law and its meetings need to be noticed per the requirements of the OML, open meeting law. I think the DAB, the DAB's inadvertent misstep is a reasonable concern for the uh, design, design review board. Um, but I don't, I'm oh, sorry, development review board, but I don't believe it warrants stating the entire, starting the pr entire process over. So for the audience's edification, there's, a, there's an application pending before the development review board, the DRB, and that application that's under review or that process that DRB is conducting on that application uh, includes uh, consideration, evaluation um, of the DAB's report to them. It's an advisory opinion as to whether this application uh, comports with the uh, guidelines. We have a set of guidelines that govern how projects are to be uh, constructed or otherwise uh, approved um, in the historic district. Um, the DAB did meet with regard to that particular project and the speaking of is the uh, Janet Ansel, Steve Rainus project. They're proposing to build a small house on their existing property that I think is, they're gonna subdivide off a lot of some three plus acres is what I understand. Um, and uh, they did meet with the applicants, did consider the application, did arrive at an opinion that's in writing, a written opinion that they then delivered to the DRB. There was a DRB hearing recently. Um, and then later on, uh, subsequent to that formal DRB meeting, they continued the meeting to a site visit, I believe last Saturday morning uh, at the project site. Again, um, so let me continue on. That's the background. Uh, Jim Barlow says, uh, I would recommend the, the Development Review Board issue an interim decision directed to the DAB and copied to all interested persons stating to the effect that it has come to the DRB's attention that the DAB failed to warn its meeting and site visit on the Ansel application in accordance with the requirements of the open meeting law. Therefore, the DRB requests that the DAB hold a new properly warned meeting to review the application, conduct a site visit, and issue new written comments to the DRB. Those new comments will be available to all interested persons as a public record. The DRB will review the DAB's new comments. And if new comments are substantively different than the DAB's original comments, the DRB will reopen the Ansel hearing to receive testimony, et cetera, on the DAB's new comments. Otherwise, the DAB comments are not if they are not substantively different, the DRB will issue a decision without reopening a hearing. So, and any closes that he hopes this is helpful. So I um, wanted to bring that to the fore. That's his opinion. He's essentially advising that we, the select board reach out to the DRB and at an ism of his opinion here um, and ask that they reconfigure the process to take into account the uh, inadvertent missteps with regard to public notification and public uh, process associated with the open meeting law. And one, one of the things Jim said was in looking at the statute, it tells you what you're supposed to do to follow the open meeting law. It doesn't tell you what you're supposed to do if something inadvertently doesn't happen. Um, so this is an opportunity to hopefully cure the issue because there's no guidance in statute of how you, how do we, how do you go back now and fix this? So, and if I might add, and I think this is something that I can discuss openly, 
and and more in a more general context even if we have any board that contributes to a public process a permitting process and they contribute documentation that was arrived at outside of the expectations for instance of the open meeting law um, it calls that process into question uh, and if we as a select board allow that to continue forward and there is an appeal we then have the unfortunate situation where we have to make a choice whether to invest the legal resources to defend that decision of our DRB or not or even if we feel like it was inappropriate challenge uh -oh, all this is you froze i i don't know where i froze am i not there yeah you're there now you're there i don't know where i got cut off the word um, challenge the legal challenge the well whatever that was the if if the drb if a drb decision is premised upon information that was born out of a committee of the town, such as the Conservation Commission, and it, that becomes part of the record, and that was arrived at, those opinions, uh, those advisory opinions, those, those that, that, yeah. Um, and the DRB relies in whole and part, or in part upon those opinions, and they were arrived at outside of what is required under the open meeting law that DRB decision, if challenged, this could be something we would have a hard time defending. Nevertheless, we would be expending significant legal resources. And and, and quite frankly, I, as one select board member, I, I don't wanna defend something that we knew going into it was, was inappropriate. So I, I think the prudent thing for to do is to follow, follow Jim Barlow's good advice and um, as a select board recommend that the DRB take a step back, put things on hold, and ask the DAB, the Design Advisory Board, to go back and restart that process and, and work through that legitimately. And my understanding is that process would be they don't just warn a meeting and then move forward, that they, it needs to be open to the public. And like our select board meetings, our planning commission meetings, our conservation commission meetings, our road committee meetings, and every, any other committee of the town, um, that they are open to to input uh, from interested residents. Uh, and if there's a pro and con side from all sides and that they objectively consider all comments that are relevant uh, and appropriately presented. Um, I also would strongly suggest that we make clear that um, they, yeah, that their minds be open uh, just open generally because uh, they should not be viewing any participants in this restarted process as problem parties that they, every, they need to understand and respect that every part, resident of this town has a right to participate in the permitting process. This is part of the permitting process. It's an expectation that's, that's described in our zoning that the DAB will review projects in the historic district um, so um, I, I would ask that you know, I would want to see the DAB perform their duties with an open mind and, and uh, with respect, as I, I think they would. Yeah. And also, when we're when this is all said and done, having reviewed the guidelines for the district, um, which have to be um, approved by the select board, which we did back in 2008, I would like us to put on our list of things to do to revisit those guidelines and make clear in there some things that I think aren't clear about the process. <laughs> okay, um, Craig, it looks like you have a fire going there. Is that true? They are citronellic candles because the mosquitoes have D's. Oh, yeah, the mosquitoes are pretty bad. Oh, I, I thought you were enjoying like a nice campfire. <laughs> You're glowing. What can I say? Yeah, it's a seance. I do this. 
Okay. Um, Craig, did you have anything you wanted to say? Uh, yes, uh, just a short statement of thanks, honestly, to John. Uh, I knew I was right. I have a lot of experience in open meeting law in the way of being a board member and the vice president of the board of the Calgary Library. And while the library follows open meeting law to the T in terms of committee meetings and board meetings, meetings are warned and minutes are provided. They're posted within five days of the meeting uh, uh, draft minutes. We are not required to by law because Calicover Library is a private nonprofit. However, yep. the Vermont Department of Libraries strongly suggests that all libraries be as open as possible for their patrons because we are asking the people of Callis in Worcester and Middlesex, et cetera, for a lot of money every year. And it's every taxpayer's right to know what we're discussing, what we're doing with that money, policy decisions, all of that. And so I only heard through the grapevine that there was going to be a site visit by the DAB. It turned out that was the second site visit and I asked to attend. And I was met with hesitation by the de facto chair, Mr. Sheets, who needed to consult with Mr. McCullough, who hesitated and said, well, would you ask Ms. Ansel if it's okay? Honestly, that was not necessary, but I did, and she agreed, and I stood there and listened. I took some photographs as part of that, just to record, to document. Everyone, most everyone knows I'm a photographer. I've taken thousands of pictures from that house site because it's beautiful. And so I asked Mr. McCullough numerous times will your discussions be open? Will there be minutes provided? I want to read the minutes of your discussion. Will you provide me personally with the opinion? Not only am I just an interested party here in town, I also am an adjoining landowner. And so I was really surprised that I had not received notice of this meeting because it's a town committee. And I told this to John and he said, well, we've just never done it that way. And I said, regardless, it's open meeting law. And I knew I was on the ground. And, and I really thank John very much for delving into this. Um, I feel vindicated. It's a long process. And frankly, I am one of only a few people who is opposed to this project. I'm being vilified. I, I'm receiving nasty emails from people. And, and it's really disappointing. And yet, I'm really gratified to know that in the beginning, I was on solid ground. The process should be open. Anybody who wants to attend can voice an opinion and, and moving forward, um, I, I'm happy that that might happen more so with all committees. Thank you. John? John? I just want to underscore that, Craig, had you contacted any member of the select board, I'm 10% confident the outcome would have been identical that yeah. no member of this board would ever do anything but what I did. Um, that's how we roll here. And uh, and I, I wanna apologize, at least from my perspective, this somehow slipped under our radar. It's really on us to make sure our boards are educated and have the tools they need to conduct their meetings. We did do an educational session some years ago, and it was back when Jim Barlow was with the League of Cities and Towns, so I wanna say seven, eight years ago. Um, and it, it, it's just a reminder that this is something we need to consistently, you know, you know, work on and, and fine tune and and educate our board members, which our boards are constantly turning over. And uh, it's an ongoing process. We're we're going to need to put together a, a bullet sheet that needs to be handed out at to every board and every new member of every board, like a, an information package. Well, I think, yeah, I think we need to send out a reminder. I think we did. When we had one of our appreciation things at the town garage recently, we had Jim Barlow um, do a quick date up on the open meeting law. And I think we just need to every year when we do appointments, reappointments, that we provide every single member of every board commission committee a written statement of what is expected for open meetings. 
to follow the open meeting law. So um, I'm glad I'm glad that you are under understand and appreciate the effort that's gone into this today, Craig. Thank you. Yeah. If I could, just one other brief comment, and that is, I do understand from having served on the road committee, it's hard to find enough people to serve. There are lots of committees, there are lots of important work that needs to be done. And, and there are only four members of the design advisory board right now. There are supposed to be five. David and I, David Sheets and I talked for hours about this issue. I did not have a copy of the guidelines and one was never sent to me when it was published. I got one in 1998 when I built my house, but it was out of date. It took six weeks to get that. And I kept emailing both David and the town clerk. And finally, I found one on my doorstep and it turns out the town clerk had left it for me. And I sent them both an email and said, thank you very much. I am only looking for information. And so, and, and there are a lot, there, there's a lot of work, there are few people and, and I know that's hard. Yeah, and, I, and just so you know, the guidelines are on the website. That's where I found them. I, I did find them there. I wanted a hard copy so I could oh, okay. highlight stuff. And of course the town office is closed and you know, it, it was right. comp, but I did finally get one. Okay, um, good. And Denise, I just want to say quickly, I really appreciate your, your speaking to the protocol and procedures because at the DRB hearing Thursday night, I tried to ask the questions of the chair what are the protocols here? What are the expectations? What are the outcomes from tonight? How do I file an appeal? No, 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 we can't answer those now. You know, ask me at the end. And it was a very difficult thing to not, at the beginning of the meeting, have the, there was no agenda other than we're gonna have this hearing. And this is the process, you know, Peg did describe it somewhat generally at the beginning, but to have all that stuff spelled out is only going to enhance everything for everybody. So, good. Yeah. Okay, Naomi. Yeah. Um, Can you speak closer to the mic? Yeah, sure. Um, I'm here tonight because I was at both the Thursday night call and the site meeting. And, um, you know, we just bought this house like a few months ago and last year, late last year. And so we are in the historical district. And so when we saw the sign go up, which was just maybe 10 days ago, we saw the Zoom meeting and I thought, well, I, I wanna know what's, what's going on. And I closed my laptop at the end of the meeting and I, and I burst out in tears and I looked at my husband, I'm like, we have to get out of here. Like, this is crazy. Um, Craig uh, was articulate and asked questions. I spoke up nobody else spoke up everybody just said oh it's beautiful janet um the intimidation was mind-boggling to me um and the same thing was a repeat on saturday morning just rudeness um craig being shut down who had a very good articulate calm presentation that he made I listened to comments going on behind his back, you know, between Janet and I think it was Judy. Um, I, I was I was blown away, and I felt frightened to say anything. I don't like the house. I think it looks cheap. I don't think it helps the area. I don't think it's beautiful like Nell and Nick's house that just blends in so beautifully. Um, I felt very uncomfortable to say anything. So I don't know anything about the protocol and the process that's supposed to happen. And I'm sure we can back up and, and redo that. But how, I'm really asking this, how do you stop this intimidation? How do you make it so people actually feel comfortable to voice their opinion? And I guess part of it is getting people there that feel comfortable enough to even go. I mean, my husband was like, what are you bothering for? She's gonna do whatever she wants. So John. I'm being really honest here. <laughs> that's that's the feeling that I walked away with that they're entitled, um, they own the town. And even though, uh, you know, we just came back here and we own more land than they do, but it doesn't matter. You know, they're, they're just gonna do what they want. And that's the feeling that I walked away from. And John? It's, it's extremely upsetting. Uh, to Naomi's question, I think, I don't think it was rhetorical. Um, about intimidation and what to do. Um, if any board member, including the select board, intimidates anyone, 
the rest of the select board or the select board needs to know. Yeah. Um, if you have a concern, we want to know the name of the person, what they said, please put it in writing as soon as you hear it. So we know it's as much as what you remember what they did, said or did or uh, the general public, I, I would hope that chairs of committees would limit that. But we, even our select board meetings, we have public lash out across, you know, we've had numerous meetings uh, where the issues are contentious. People yell back and forth and get threatening. And we've, in one case, I almost had to walk a guy out. I didn't know if it was going to come to blows, but I got up to walk him out and he walked himself out. But uh, that's the public. But if anybody who's appointed by this select board uh, intimidates anybody, we need to know that. And, and we need to, for ourselves, make a judgment as to whether it was intimidation. It could be just the recipient, but it, we need to know what happened. Um, John, it will not and, be tolerated and, and, public officials. Yeah, and, and in this case, it some of it is unspoken. You know, some of it is, uh, how do you measure that? Some of it was, you know, just shutting Craig down, um, literally, you know, y yelling out time like that. Um, when he was in the middle of his presentation um, that I was really interested in. And well, the, you know, yeah. the nice thing, one of the, one of the only nice things about Zoom is it's all completely recorded. Absolutely. So well, Denise, I nice to see the Thursday night meeting and I'm sure, I mean, it, it was. And just so you know, the select board, I probably is, as generous as we can possibly be with taking comments from the public, even to sometimes people saying we take too much comment, but it is the town. Everybody's a resident, everybody's equal. Nobody is better than anybody else because they have three acres or 300 acres. It doesn't matter, everybody is equal. Or how long you've lived here, whether you've lived here six weeks or you've lived yep. here, your family's been here 200 years. Right. I mean, I've ex I've experienced that exact same thing, Naomi, when I first moved here. You know, how long have you been here? Oh, I'm sorry, Sage. Did you want to speak? I I want to support. I mean, let let Naomi talk, but I would like to chime in about what happened on Saturday morning. Oh, okay. And on the Thursday evening call, I mean, I asked about the site too and i you know i spoke up and said you know we're, we're looking at the house but i don't i live right up the road and i have no idea where it's actually going to be is it going to be in the field is it going to be on the driveway i i don't know i really i would love to have another site visit and the only response came back from peg who said are you done yeah well What's you know right. and i said yeah. yes yeah. i'm done and that was it. There was no answer. There was nothing. There was no interaction with any of Craig's questions or mine and or nothing. It, it was very, very strange. So Sage, you wanted to have a, I think I can't see if Brooke, somebody said Brooke has her hand up, but. Oh, uh, go I, ahead, Brooke. If somebody has their hand up, by all so means. You, you've been trying to chime in. So go ahead, Sage. I just want to say, you know, I showed up at a site meeting. <laughs> I wasn't at the Zoom meeting on Thursday night, okay? But, all right, there's a site meeting going on. Craig and I, I had open eyes. Craig and I, like, Craig, is, Craig has shut me down in school board. You know, Craig is great. He's a town moderator. He's been great. He was so professional and so humble and just so hoping to express his concerns. And I walked in there and I honestly had no opinion of, about what was going on. And it was hostile. It, that's the only thing I have to say. And it was weird. It felt like every decision had been made and it it was just it was very very strange and that denise thank you for thank you all it's you know 9 41 on a monday night and i really appreciate this to be able to speak so thanks so much you're welcome brooke did you want to speak thank you if i just might uh 
I just have a couple of public comments to make. Um, I am a practicing attorney in Vermont and have done board work for municipalities as well as lots of zoning board work as well. Um, and what I'm struck with listening to this conversation goes back to, I think, what Mr. Brabant was saying originally, which really has to do with training of the people that you have in these positions. And as Craig mentioned, very hard to get people um, who can devote the sufficient time. But it is essential that people in these positions understand that they wield the governmental power in a permitting situation to control what one can do with their own property. And we have the Fifth Amendment clause that says government can't take your property <clears throat> without just compensation. Well, regulatory takings can happen. And so the question becomes, are the people that are in those places of power that you have delegated your authority to as a select board by putting them into place, do they have the knowledge to conduct business under the open meeting law properly? It sounds like that needs to be remedied, which is great that you folks are taking responsibility and making sure, particularly during this pandemic, <clears throat> with all of the challenges of Zoom and all of that. <clears throat> but what I hear are personal interactions here face to face. For example, at a site visit where people are trying to articulate their positions, the very first thing a DRB needs to explain to people is what a site visit is, what it's for, and that you can't take testimony, but people can point things out so that one can put them into context when they actually go to a hearing and get testimony. So these are the kinds of procedural safeguards that we have to protect the process to make sure that everyone is treated equally. And whether you, um, you know, so for example, this, this protects the applicants who might be of some stature in the community or might be lawyers, believe me. I know what it's like to be a lawyer <laughs> and to have an automatic assumption that you have a leg up uh, in the process because of your superior knowledge. So it is essential under these circumstances to ensure that the original DAB, I think you're calling it, um, <clears throat> not be a secret process, um, that that report is a public document. The applicant, Janet Ansel, should not have been sending that, but she did so because she knew it needed to go to them. Um, and it's shocking that it didn't. So when you get to the DRB level, showing up at a site visit or at a Zoom hearing and being treated as if you were a member of the public to only be limited to, to some public comment where you're actually an abutter who should be considered an interested party who's there to participate and to establish their standing legally to participate in the actual process of having their say as the next door neighbor, person across the street, or someone in the immediate neighborhood. Um, or there can be a group of people, if you have a requisite petition from citizens to participate. But particularly under these circumstances with prominent folks, um, you know, the, the appearance of impropriety that, that has been suggested through some of the interactions here, um, feeling like you only get a certain amount of time instead of you being a participant and a party to this process. Um, sounds like Craig lives across the street, he's in a butter. And he shouldn't be told, no, you're a public comment person. He should be recognized as someone who is a party, is trying to establish standing. And um, to foreclose his comments, that is, that is uh, going to be an appealable issue that will send this right back down to the DRB if the environmental court gets a hold of it, because the participation of a person, of an interested party in this permitting process, they have to establish their interest and the issues that they raise articulates the scope of their uh, case and their appeal. 
So if you don't let them have their say before the DRB, you are not allowing them to establish whatever the scope is of what they need to provide for evidence. And so if they go up on appeal and say, I wasn't allowed to speak, they'll do one of two things. They'll decide it anew because, <clears throat> pardon me, all of those problems below can be remedied because the environmental division is gonna make their own decision. But um, if you hamper the folks from developing their evidence and presenting their case at the lower level, uh, you know, you're, you're opening it up to a remand. Now, I am thrilled that you folks are, you know, understand the ramifications. Why do you wanna spend public monies defending you know, posi uh, positions or decisions that are procedurally infirmed. They, you know, you might call it technicalities, but due process of law by government agencies is the most basic right in our constitution. And thank you for making sure that these processes are going to be by law and they're going to not intimidate people and make them think that because someone has a lot of power and influence or has lived there for generations, and by the way, the DRB should not be asking people, how long have you lived here? That is not a proper question. That has nothing to do with anything. And that gives the immediate response or reaction that this is a done deal. And there is no fair hearing and there are no due process rights to actually be heard and have the information that you present be considered, analyzed, and a determination be made by law, not who's lived there the longest. So thank you very much, John Brabant and the select board for Denise, thank you very much. This is a real public service that you are making sure the integrity of your government is without reproach. Thank you, Brooke, we appreciate your comment. Okay, so is there any further, anything further to do on this, John? I think we beat this one to death at this point, uh, you know, but we, beyond this issue, for me, this is a, a case in point to why we need to, this is a priority issue to revisit with not only the DAB, which is number one priority, but also all our boards, I, I think that we need to kind of re, re circle back around on this one, maybe have a yeah. more global meeting and education on Zoom with all of our boards invited. Um, and then they can ask questions and, and learn about this. I, we have volunteers and I, I feel really bad for, you know, the, the DAB folks, you know, they volunteer, they do their best. They're, they're not trained by us. They're not given an information package or a training package. And we just, so here you go. Make sure, you, I guess the assumption is make sure you do the right thing, whatever that is. And it's not too much different than with our current DRB. Um, we used to have DRBs chaired by competent attorneys. Steve Rainus was a DRB chair. Chuck Starrow was a DRB chair. Yeah. Vice chair being Warren Coleman. All three of those gentlemen are attorneys. Uh, I believe Sharon, a she, yeah, she was on the DRB. She was on the DRB, another competent attorney. And when you don't have any folks like that on that board to act as, you know, guides through uh, the, the processes, um, that's, it sets us up for failure. And it's not because anyone is deliberately trying to abuse their authority. Um, but it also uh, allows for the infiltration of inappropriate uh, statements and discussions and you really need a chair that's going to disallow that and certainly you should not have a chair participating in those kinds of discussions as may have been occurred here i don't know um, um, sharon wanted to say something uh, yeah i just want to say to everybody i'm being uncharacteristically quiet because i have a conflict on this issue or on this on this matter when we okay. have a pleasant matter and we talk more holistically about boards and training then I then I will be engaging as a board member so that's yeah we probably won't talk about that tonight because it's almost 10 and I know Sharon's turning into a pumpkin I am the air is off in my building 
Okay. Um, okay. So are we ready to move on? Is there no, oh, uh, Rose, do you have your hand up? Yeah, I just wanted to publicly say um, how horrible I feel. I mean, I'm so very pleased, Craig and Naomi, that you brought this to the select board. Now we know about it. Um, that's not who we are as callous citizens. That's not that's just not right. It's wrong on so many levels. And, um, you know, the appearance of impropriety. I mean, I think you'd have to be Helen Keller to think that there wasn't an appearance of impropriety. I mean, I'm just so blown away by this. It's so wrong on so many levels. So I just want to refer back to what John Brabant said in the email from Jim Barlow about what we do now going forward immediately tomorrow. Um, what the process is going to be and john you spoke about that um jim barlow has laid this out but um you know this gets to the root of who we are why we live in this town why we care about each other how we treat each other um and so i just wanted to put that out there well and you'll notice you'll notice at the bottom of my emails kindness is first kindness is second and kindness is third yeah Rose, All thank right. you very much. That, that means a lot to hear. Thank you so much. Sure. All right. Are we done with this matter? So we can, we have one more thing I'd at least like to get through if everybody can stand it. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Chair, for putting this on the agenda on such short notice. Um, yes, no problem at all. Um, and I, you might just, with us coming just to in. note, I'm an alternate on this matter. Um, and I was like 15 minutes late because I couldn't get onto this stupid Zoom thing. And apparently nobody was introduced. So um, I apologize for that. There were a couple of us DRB members who insisted on a site visit. So anyways, and I got asked at six o'clock that morning to participate. And everybody knows I don't read email at six o'clock in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> like Rose, try me about- Yeah, 10. me and you both. Right, nine or 10, maybe I'll read email, but not six yeah. o'clock in the morning. That's right. All right, thank you so much. And just know thank that we're, you, we're on top of it. Yes, yeah, thank you. Thank you all so much. I'm gonna sign off, it's time for ice cream. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you, Brooke, for the education. Yes. Brooke, CLE for that. My bill's in the mail. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Brooke. Good to hear from you. Thank you, folks. I appreciate it. Didn't mean to lecture. You really are doing good work. Thank you. We're trying. Thank you all. Okay. Um, process for signing the orders. It looks like this is going to go on for a while longer. Um, used to be we would pass them around the table. Barbara came up with a suggestion of how we might resolve this round robin of orders. I think Cliff had a suggestion as well. Um, so I can let Cliff give his suggestion and then my concern with the suggestion. Uh, well, I know that uh... We don't like the idea of having to go to the town office to sign things, um, but these documents are, they impact a lot of different processes that go on and certainly a lot of different things that uh, Sandra is working on. There is also um, some sensitive information included in these orders, um, people's pay rates and things like this. Um, uh, my proposal was that perhaps we could put them in the lockbox at the mudroom, um, that there be, we could even arrange to have a key with uh, one of the combinations to like what we're talking about putting in at the town hall. So people could go in, punch in the combination, get the key, open the lockbox, sign the documents, put them back in, and that uh, we try to find some kind of protocol that we could agree upon that um, if everybody can't make it down there to sign it, 
that's okay because as long as we get at least three members of the board signing off on them, then Sandra has what she needs and can go back and show the auditors that we have a process in place uh, that we had to adjust for this. Um, also, we would probably want to consider once we get the word that there are some orders there to be signed, we agree as a team what is the time frame we can expect to turn it around in so that uh, Judy and Sandra, who are definitely, um, and Barbara as well, uh, you know, they're dealing with some uh, extreme circumstances just like we all are and anything we can do to help alleviate their levels of stress, I think we should look at. So, yeah, and I think in my email, I laid out a couple of issues with the orders not being back at the office with the, um, you know, we have a monthly audit done by Cindy at Nemrick. And quite often, you know, they just pull out random, random things that they see in the Nemrick reports. They need to see copies of the invoice to match it up with the Nemrick entry. So not having the orders back to the town office in a timely manner, you know, does present a, a problem. And, and in addition to the ones that, that Cliff suggested, Judy is a little hesitant about the lockbox thing because she's concerned, especially when ballots start coming in, tax payment starts coming in. She's a little hesitant um, for us to be going into the lockbox. Not that we would intentionally do anything, but she's worried that stuff might come up missing. What if it gets caught in with some other paperwork? Um, and when I, when I review the, the orders, I have them on the table, I spread them out, I have my little ruler, and I go through each and every entry, each and every invoice, each and every check. And that's why you, when you see, after I've done it, I have a little check mark. That, that's my process. So doing that in the parking lot, I could do it. I will do it if that's what we decide as a team to do, but it will make it difficult. Yeah, I'm with you, Denise. I mean, when I don't want a process where it's, it's, it's a pro forma signature. I mean, when the five of us sit around the table, there's, you know, generally one or more of us who, you know, we do just sign it, but somebody always catches something and asks questions. And if we're, if we don't have the opportunity and there's no, we're, our process isn't even designed to suggests that we're actually looking at them. I don't think that's a good process. So I know this last time was a little difficult. People have work schedules, vacation schedules, kids schedules, all that stuff. But if we could, as a team, agree to be more on top of it and getting it passed off to the next, I think Barbara calls it a round robin. Um, I think really that's really the only choice right now. Well. I mean, one of the one of the issues we had is we didn't get them. There, were, I mean, the stack we got was like this because, yeah, I mean, I I had them for. I had June orders, so it was and March orders, so there was a whole stack that we got at once. So, there we, right? We need, to, we need to do it more often. There's every every time. There's more. There's process improvement on the front end too. Yeah. What if we? I, I looked at Barbara's suggestion, 24 hours is, is that's not enough time for me, it just isn't. Um, so I, I, I would never commit to turning them around in 24 hours. I mean, I'm here, I, I left my house at 6.30 this morning, I'm here at 10 o'clock at night. 24 hours is not realistic. No, but, I, I agree. Um, the other thing is, oh, if only three of us have to sign them, then part of the round robin can be which three of us are taking responsibility for this set. So what I could do is after I sign them, I can send an email to the rest and say who wants to be next so that we can keep them moving. And then somebody can say, I'll be next. How soon can you do it? And move it along that way so that we're hitting people that are available. Can we yeah. actually, can we actually have a schedule? <laughs> I mean, I will do better if we, if I know that this week it's 
this week is I have to make the space and not in 24 hours, but if you give me 48, I can, I can do it in a week. I know that this is my job. Well, we can decide that like at a select board meeting because the orders are done for every select board meeting. So like right now, um, I have the orders who wants to be next and who, and how soon can you turn it around? I'm looking at my calendar. I can get it to Denise, whoever's I'll pick them up. You okay? So do you want to pick them up tomorrow? We can arrange to pick them up. Yeah. You can pick them up, or I can drive them to you. Either way. I mean, it's uh, all a matter of just cooperation. It's a little bit of pain Denise, in the neck. Going to the clerk, Denise, you're going to the clerk's office tomorrow, so you can swing by Cliffs, dump them up there. And no, I'm not going to the clerk's office. I sent I sent the stuff to Sharon to sign. Sharon's going to there. Oh, okay. But if Cliff wants to be Cliff wants to be next, <laughs> I, what if I call you in the morning, Cliff, when I'm done with everything, getting everything, everybody, all the critters around here fed? Well, you then, can call me in the morning when you're done, but it's probably easier if you just call me Cliff. Okay. <laughs> Are you done? Are you well done? Medium done. Biff, well done. And Rose, what's your schedule look like? Are you at work? Yeah, um, but I, if he, if he looks at them, do you think you'll look at them tomorrow, Cliff? Yeah, if if, uh, if Denise and I can get them transferred from her to I in the morning, yeah, then yeah, I could definitely do them. Yeah, because tomorrow, when I get out of work at six, I'm going to go by the town office and sign some papers. Then from there, I could go to Cliff's house and bring the orders home with me tomorrow in the evening. Okay. And then they're done. Three of you, done. Here's three. So then we just need to get them back to the town office for um, Judy or Barbara. Barbara's working afternoons. Judy's working mornings, I guess. Okay. And they could, and one of them can just pick them up and put them in the office and then they're there and, and they're in the vault where they need to be. Yep. All right. Excellent. Thank you so much. All right. Is everybody ready to be done? I we think so. John? John? Unmute yourself. Uh, I'm unmuting myself. You never believed I could be muted. So um, Denise is acting chair. I'm acting vice chair. We have simple procedural thing to get done and I'd like to get it done tonight. Okay. I know I would like to be vice chair. I would like Denise to continue to be a chair. She does a wonderful job. And I'd like to, as I said, or threatened many, many months ago that I would be stepping down and I would be nominating, looking to nominate Sharon Fannin in my stead. I think she was interested at that point in time. I don't know if she still is. Um, so I would like to get this done um, now. So I'm, I'm going to propose uh, a slate, uh, Denise Wheeler as chair, Sharon Wynn as vice chair. Uh, Katie is our secretary, right? Recording secretary. She needs to be disappointed. Okay. So I'd like to move those two individuals for the chair and vice chair position. And I'd like to also, um, at some point, you know, we need to come up with roles, responsibilities, and, and how we do things going forward. I want to also say that I really think this meeting went well tonight. Huge agenda, but you really did a great job, Denise. Thank you. All together and moving us through. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for recognizing that. That doesn't, that means a lot. You left, so thank you. But I, I, so that's a motion and I'd look for a second for those. I'll questions. second that. Please. Okay, is there any further discussion? Are you ready to vote? I'm sure Sharon's turning into a pumpkin any minute. I'm waiting for her to turn orange. I've already turned pink. Oh, <laughs> all right. Let's take a roll call vote. Cliff. Aye. Sharon. Aye. Rose. Aye. John. Aye. And I'm an aye. And I'd, I'd like to make note, the women are in charge. We're always in charge, didn't you know that? I, oh, I know that, but I, I'm psyched. Thank you. 
for doing that. You, Thank uh, you. Aaron and Denise. All right, I was prepared to do minutes, but, um, and I did have a couple of questions, Cliff, I sent you about a couple of the minutes that Katie didn't have the information. So maybe when you have a chance, not right now, see if you can answer those questions. Yeah, um, I saw you sent one of them. I'll take a look at the other yeah. one. I know what you're talking about. I already addressed one of them. Okay. And don't forget July 27th, 630 to set the tax rate and send me any ideas that you want for the agenda. And I'm, the agenda seems to happen because there's always something going on. Can I make a motion that we, um, notwithstanding I'm turning into a pumpkin, that we go into executive session for personnel matters under one VSA section 313A3? Of course. I'll second that. Cliff? Aye. Rose? Aye. Sharon? Aye. John? Aye. And I'm an aye. Katie, that right. was at 10.07. Thank you, Katie. Thank you, Katie. Thank you, Katie. Thank you. The recording has stopped.